This is the clapper for one take one, Geek Marcel, and uh, here we go, interview by Tony Fletcher. Right, Deke, um, you've got a very interesting name. Can you tell me about your parents, where you were brought up, and, 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 and you know, your name? Well, my name comes from my father, actually, because it was his nickname also. The family was in Troy, New York, which is up the Hudson River from New York City. And I was born and raised there, went to secondary school there. But at some point, I was playing basketball for Troy High high school and uh, I did something strange in a game and the local sports writer wanted to write up the something to do with that game and um, he knew I was Deke's son but he didn't know my first name so he put in Deke Rossell uh, and of course my dad got a lot of calls from his friends saying they didn't know he was quite so young and so spry as to be playing basketball down at the high school or why didn't he have a degree or whatever else and uh, everybody had a good joke about it but the kids at school picked it up from me and when I went off to university um, I kept it because I thought it was a little bit more poetic than my regular name. My father had been named Ernest William Russell, and he hated being called Ernie. So as the son of a Methodist preacher, he took up the nickname Deacon, which is common in the United States for ministers who have sons Deacon. be called Deacon. And Deacon is a shortening of that. Not at all common in, in the UK, where a deacon is a particular official inside the uh, established church. Um, so it's not used here very much at all. It's quite unique uh, in Europe. Not, if, not common, but not unusual in, in, the U, in the US. So I just got it from my dad. My dad, by the way, if I move over here, is on my desk in... Um, his days as a radio announcer. He was a, a graduate of, um, of uh, Fredonia, the State University of New York's uh, conservatoire uh, for music, and was a music teacher and uh, uh, specialized in vocal work. So his, one of his early jobs, right after he got out of university, was with the radio station KDKA in uh, Pittsburgh. That was the first commercial radio station in the United States of America, where pretty quickly he had a 15-minute show of songs and as a vocalist. So he had a long career. When would this have been? That would have been in the middle 1930s. Um, the picture I just picked up would be from the late 1940s and into the 1950s, when he was a news reporter and news broadcaster on, on radio. He was quite prominent in the local area of Albany and Troy and Schenectady. Um, but he's the guy in our family who had the good voice. He really had a brilliant, brilliant voice, beautifully resonant. He did a lot of, um, uh, he did a lot of, um, 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 what I want to say, uh, soundtracks, uh, narrations for industrial films over at General Electric uh, Company in Schenectady because he could record the material. And they might call him up six months later and say, we changed the device a little bit and we want to lay in another phrase here or there. And he could go in six months later, record the 10 words or the sentence or the phrase that they wanted to change in the film, and it would just match, just absolutely match. You could lay it in a year later. It would still match. He just had a wonderful, a wonderful voice. The irony of that uh, family upbringing, small town, about 70,000 people, Troy, not especially important town in the 20th century, was in the 19th century, but the irony of that is that he knew Thomas Edison face to face. And uh, given my later career in early cinema work, I think always think it's quite an irony that my dad's one of the very few people that I would have been able to be in contact with at all who actually knew Thomas Edison. How did he know him? He knew him again through music because at Fredonia, Fredonia is in western New York State, is, is the campus, and it's not too far from Chautauqua, where, you know, the Chautauqua Institution is and one thing and another. And Summers, he was at the Chautauqua Institution 
partly because his father, the Methodist minister, was running the Grange Hall there, which took in residence uh, during the summertime as a countryside Grange organization, but also because he was a part of the um, Chautauqua Light Opera Company. He had a good voice and he was singing all summer. They gave him some room and board to do that, and then he got a little practice room. And Edison spent his summers in Chautauqua late in his life um, because his wife, Minna, was the wife of a man by the name of Miller, who was the founder of Chautauqua. So Edison had a little cottage built for himself and his wife so that she could visit with her father during the summers when he was at Chautauqua. And the, the kids, you know, college kids, my dad, uh, would kind of run around. This was the most famous living American of all time we were there that they were around. And they'd go down to the cottage and see if Minna needed the porch painted or a window repaired or something else done or some groceries carried around one thing and another. And um, uh, uh, they were all particularly, you know, happy to go down there and have a, a word with Mr. Edison and see the great celebrity and one thing and way before celebrities, but that's what they liked to do. So he was a part of that. Uh, Chautauqua Institution itself on Chautauqua Lake, about halfway down the lake, um, is completely without cars. You pay an entrance fee to get into the institution, you have your accommodation, there are places to eat, and then you have free access to for many, many years, including my dad's early years, um, the best symphony orchestra in the United States of America. And uh, the Chautauqua Literary Society is the first ever book club in America, in America. So lots of lectures, lots of stuff going on, all free once you're inside the gate. And inside, it's very peaceful. It's really quite relaxing. Uh, old fashioned hotels uh, and no cars. Mr. Edison, however, was permitted a car on the, on the grounds. He was very old and quite infirm. And he would drive the car, it was an electric car, so it made no noise. This is 1932, 33, 34. And he would drive the car up to the, um, to the um, um, auditorium where the, it was kind of a covered banked seating where the symphony orchestra played. And, just as the concert started, the car would back up, roll up to one of the exits. A big back door on the, on, the, on the car would open quietly by a chauffeur. And Mr. Edison would sit there and listen to the concert through a big speaking horn that he had built into the, built into the car. And then just before the concert ended, as people started applauding, the door would close, the car would move silently away, and nobody would even know it was there. And that's how Edison listened to the Chautauqua concert. What about your mother? My mother is a, a, a very interesting woman because, um, again, we're talking in the early 1930s here. She was a college graduate. She went to the Rochester Institute of Technology and got a degree in um, fashion design. She, um, uh, her father was an engineer worked for Stromberg Carlson Company in Rochester and before that for the Consolidated Car Heating Company, which made heating units for, for um, uh, trains, for trains. And uh, my grandfather, her father, believed in education and he sent all three of his kids to school. Whether they wanted to go or not, they went to college and got a college degree. My Uncle John, the, my mother's older brother, uh, wanted to be a farmer. He wanted to raise cows and have a, have a farm. He was passionately interested in that, absolutely refused to go to college. His father told him, you go to college, you get a degree in animal husbandry, and, it, and then you can do whatever you want to do, but you go to college first. So my mother in 1932, 33, 34, is a college-educated woman in the United States. That was not rare, exactly, but it was unusual. It wasn't the usual thing. She got a job in Albany, New York, um, 
uh, as the buyer for a big department store, a big fashionable department store in, in Albany, which is the main store in the, in the Tri-Cities area up, up the Hudson River. And um, my father at one point was teaching music in the local school in Greenwich, uh, New York and went to deliver some music to her younger brother at one point, um, who was one of his pupils, and saw the older sister who was back from college. He'd never met the older sister, and that was kind of the end of that. And do you have any siblings? I have one sister who's younger than I am, uh, seven years younger, and who, again, took a college degree in um, primary education. And she uh, has been a Montessori teacher and then a public school, that's in the U.S., a state school, uh, primary school teacher and librarian. Um, and she lives in Oregon. Uh, I moved from Troy to Syracuse to go to university and then to Boston and then to the West Coast and then to London. So I went to bigger and bigger and bigger cities. She moved from Troy to Cobleskill to go to university, to go to college, and then went into the countryside and went to smaller and smaller and smaller uh, towns. And uh, she's in a suburb of uh, Portland, Oregon now, uh, with uh, McMansions all around the property that they bought 30 years ago. It's kind of grown around them. If they could, they'd be perfectly happy to be in a much smaller community and still a little bit more isolated. We're very different uh, characters. Now, now, when you went to college, you decided to study divinity. What, why was that? Well, that came, up, that came about in a kind of an odd way, too. I did an undergraduate degree in philosophy, and that's where I was taught by David Shepard as uh, and they first started getting interested in film. As a part of getting out of university and getting out of college, I became a finalist in a, in a, um, uh, in a foundation, a foundation which had grants to send people who wouldn't ordinarily go to divinity school to try it out for a year and see what was there. And um, I, was, uh, I got to be one of the last two on that list. And they took the other guy. They didn't, they didn't take me for that foundation. They thought I might go anyway, because I had a degree in philosophy. I had studied a lot of uh, church history. I knew my way around a little bit, and they thought, well, maybe he's going to go anyway. We don't, that's not what our grant is for. So they took the other guy. When they took the other guy, Harvard wrote to me and said, we noticed they took the other guy. Would you still like to come? We'd love to have you. Uh, and we'll give you a status as a special student so you can try it out for a year on our ticket instead of on the foundation's ticket. So that's why I went. I got there. And I just hated it. I really disliked it. It was so old fashioned. It was so unmodern. It was so retro. Um, I was, at least I thought at the time, uh, I had been studying much more advanced stuff than they were willing to, willing to teach. They were in the 19th century. I was in the 20th, and then certainly right up to date in the 20th century. So I stayed my year. And, that was it for me. I was tired of being in school and tired of racking up debts for being in school, which is what you do in the United States. You, you mentioned you'd already met David Shepard. Tell us about that, him and, uh, and what you learnt from him. Well, he, he, he was my first undergraduate teacher, and he was a brilliant teacher. Now, in the first place, you've got to realise that this is a teacher who is three, four years older than you are. I mean, so he's a young teacher in the first place. And in the second place, I thought then, which is 1964, 65, that he knew everything about film, every single thing about film. I knew David for the rest of his life, and uh, I replaced him at the Director's Guild. It was my predecessor at the Director's Guild. So we started out working together a little bit when he left that job and I, and I took it over. I still thought, 30 years later, he knew everything about film, every single thing. I had learned a lot about film by then and was much more sophisticated. He still knew 
dozens of times more than I did about film. So he was quite an interesting guy. He, he, he was a brilliant teacher. He would take at one point in a classroom, regular modern classroom, low ceilings, one thing or another, he'd find somewhere an empty metal waste basket. And at one point in the class, he would kind of take out four frames of nitrate film. And he'd light them and he'd drop them into the waste basket. You'd have floor to ceiling flames, really rich, rigid frames for about three seconds. And that would be over with. As a demonstration of how flammable nitrate film is, this is absolutely unbeatable, unbeatable. He also knew all kinds of stuff. Now, I don't remember quite how it happened, but I was working at that time for the museum's projection service. And so was my roommate from uh, at, at university, an art student by the name of Jack Brubaker. And Jack and I were the two, I don't need to mince words here, were the two competent projectionists on this staff. The entire staff of the university's projection department was drawn from one fraternity, who was the, which was the fraternity of the guy who ran that department at the university. He had the job, he gave all his fraternity brothers jobs in that department. None of them could project a, a lantern slide to save their lives. They were really incompetent. They didn't show up one thing or another. Now, David Shepard, I don't really remember how this came about, but David Shepard taught most of his classes using clips from his own collection. He had an extensive collection of classic silent films and of modern films all totally illegal at the time, of course, as it is technically illegal today to own anything that the studios don't sell you directly, and they don't sell 35-millimeter prints or 16-millimeter prints of their films, then or now. So, he, by, because he was using his own prints in, in his class, he wanted a good projectionist, and he found out about Jack and myself, and he appointed the two of us as projectionists in his class. So what we learned about film and what we learned in teaching was by projecting the material that he was using to illustrate his classes. In my junior year, my third year, he left, uh, David left to go to um, State University of Pennsylvania, Penn State, in uh, State College, Pennsylvania, center of Pennsylvania, halfway from east to west and dead in the middle, completely isolated, large, important school. And the university, for reasons that uh, don't make any sense to me now, decided they wanted to keep his course going, his module going, so they brought in Jim Card to teach David Shepard's class, syllabus, for the next year. And since I hadn't registered for David's course, because I was the projectionist in David's course, I could register for Jim Card's course, so I took his course the next year. And between the two of them, they taught me what I know about, what I knew then, about film history and got me interested in film. And um, it's the only year that Jim Card taught at Syracuse. He was um, curator of the Eastman House in Rochester at that time. And I think he only was there the one year and not particularly known as a teacher. His idea of how to teach a general survey course in film history was to bring prints down from, from Rochester, 35 millimeter prints, show them as either full films or long clips in class, and show how he had the film in Rochester that showed that all the history books were wrong. And that was his whole purpose in life. That was the way he taught his material. He had a big class because he didn't limit it. David made sure that he only had like 20 people or 23 people in, in, in the class, whatever it was, small class, regular classroom. Jim Card had about 300 students in the class because it was a film course. It was a new, exciting thing, and he didn't limit it at all. So he was in the big theater down that the university owned down towards the city, which had 35 millimeter projection and a good 35 millimeter projection. And he brought these prints down. And I've often wondered, I mean, I've wondered at the time, and I wondered what the other 
243 people in that class thought film history was all about. They saw all the exceptions. They saw none of the baseline stuff. They never saw Potemkin. They never saw Dovshenko. They never saw Murnau, you know, because, because um, Jim Card was going to show them the exception that showed that all the stuff that had been written about those guys was wrong. So there's one set of 243 people walking around somewhere that has the strangest idea of what film history is or, or was. I've, I have no idea how that worked. But for me, it was perfect. I already had all the basics from David. So did, did your interest in film history come out because of this, or was it something you had developed in your teens and earlier? I would say it came about because David was such an inspirational teacher. Uh, I never went to the cinema very much as a kid. Um, my parents took me to see Bambi, which was frightening as heck, uh, as it was to many children. And then um, they went, we went once again, maybe four, five, or six years later, to another film. I forget the title now, but my family was not a film going family. They were busy with other and busy and busy with other things. And I didn't go to the films very much at all. So <laughs> it really all came from David, I think. Now I'm jumping here a little bit. Between the ages of 23 and 27, you were a film critic and associate editor in Boston. What did that entail? That entailed a little bit of everything. Um, my flatmate in Boston, in Cambridge, we had a flat in Cambridge with a guy who was also at Harvard Divinity School and who took the degree and graduated and, and went on to, a, uh, he's dead now too, um, he went on to become the, the archivist for the state of New Jersey. He was really a quite brilliant, quite creative character, Sam, Sam Wagner. And um, he came back to the flat one day. I was out of Harvard by that time. We were still living together. And said that there was a local newspaper for college students starting up that wanted a film critic. And they had put out a little advertisement to see whether or not um, they could get somebody in to become the film critic. So I applied. And thank you, Sam. Uh, that's where that came from. And. Um, I applied. I think they sent four people to write a review of a film called Casino Royale. Now, this is the original James Bond film, not like any other James Bond film you've ever seen. Five stories, five different directors, five different casts playing James Bond and the rest of it, and a kind of a, a twisted thriller comedy is what it was, seg segmented comedy. But this was the first one that was derived from um, Fleming's work. And I wrote a, went to the screening. The other four guys were there, four people. I don't remember who. Um, and I wrote the review, and they decided they'd, they'd take me as the film critic. So that's how I got that job. And for then, next five years, I worked like crazy. The f paper grew like crazy also. When I started, it was a tabloid-sized, Berliner-sized, uh, four-page handout. It was circulated around all the colleges in, in, in Boston. Um, maybe 120,000 copies. By the time I left, it was still a weekly entertainment and news newspaper, but it was 60 or 70 pages every single week and now circulating a couple hundred thousand copies around all, still all the same colleges in, 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 in Boston. It's quite a force in the city. Um, it changed this name a little bit after I left to be called, called the Boston Phoenix. And um, it went out of business about five years ago when newspapers started getting into trouble because of the digital economy. After that, I think you moved to a company called John Carter & Co. Um, film Ad Advertising and Publishing um, in New England, as well as... Um, um, uh, I think being the instructor at Orson Welles Film School in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Can you tell me about 
these two. Sure. I, I quit the, the Boston After Dark. I quit the newspaper at some point. I got terribly bored. The owner was making tons of money. Uh, he promised us the world. He gave us nothing. Um, and I quit. Two or three other the old time staff people quit as well. We were just kind of worn out a little bit, if, if anything. So at some point after I left, not too long after I left, um, a guy by the name of Carl Fazek called me up and asked me if I'd come and work with him. He had just gotten a new account at John Carter and Company and thought that he might want a little help in the, in the office. So I became vice president of John Carter and Company. John and Carter were his two sons, and the company was named after his sons. Carl was a extremely good and very well-known uh, field agent for MGM. He had worked for MGM for a decade, found a way of making himself the MGM representative for New York, uh, for uh, New England and upstate New York, not New York City, upstate New York and New England, uh, founded the independent film company, John Carter and Company, to do that work. And when he went to hire me, he uh, had just added Warner Brothers to his account list. He had a couple of local states rights distributors also, but mostly he was just doing film publicity and advertising material. And uh, I stayed with him for a couple of years, uh, but two or three uh, options we tried to get a little bit more business and do a little bit more didn't work out. Um, uh, we tried to start a, a, a film, what are they called? Film, film office, you know, where you, where you kind of bring in productions and then set up the productions and get them going. It's very something every city has now, including Boston. We were a couple of years ahead of that curve, and, and they didn't, the city didn't want to do it and didn't want to set it up. So we couldn't get accounts. And I thought, after a couple of years, some interesting experiences, but I was just stealing money from a guy I really liked and who did good work, so I quit. And um, by then I was already teaching in this little night school that started over in Cambridge, um, a guy by the name of Ralph Hoagland, who invented a, a discount pharmacy company called CVS, it was huge. They were opening a store every 14 minutes across the United States, hugely successful. He had a lot of money he didn't know what to do with. And he thought he wanted to start a, um, a film production company and make a lot of money doing that because he was interested in film. It was late 1960s, early 1970s. Everybody was interested in film in those days. You couldn't escape it. And the guys he approached to work for his film company and set up his film company wanted to f run a film school. So he compromised, thinking the films will pay for the film school and I'll start a film school, which was like called Orson Welles and got his name to permission to use his name. And Welles came to town, came to Cambridge, and led a, a torchlight parade through the streets of Cambridge for the opening of the cinema and ultimately the school, both named, af named after him. And uh, irony of ironies, what turned out was that the school made money because nobody was teaching film anywhere around uh, Boston except for Boston University. And um, he never really made any money for the filmmaking. That didn't work. But that crew of, that team of, of film make makers in the school um, did the first um, John Sayles picture. Um, um, I forget what it's called now. And also the second one, Leanna. But the first one was populated completely by the Orson Welles people. Um, what's it called? I'll think, I'll think of it in a minute. This is going on. And they were really quite good. So that was another interesting set of experiences um, and started me on a teaching career because I hadn't done any teaching before that. In 1974 up to 1987, 13 years, you worked as the film coordinator for the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Yep. Um, there you included programming films Preston Sturges, Czech Cinema, Zanussi, 
New German Cinema, and I, it, it, I think that's there that you met Catherine White as well. Can uh, you Catherine, tell us something Catherine about Catherine Stone, Catherine Stone White was my predecessor as film coordinator at the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, I got involved with the museum's film program while I was working for John Carter and Company uh, because Kitty White was an absolute fanatic for documentation. She really wanted to have good film notes and good credits in those film notes for every film that she showed at the museum. And if you remember the primitive days of film study uh, in the early 1970s and across the 1970s into the 1980s, there was no IMDB. There was no central source of credits. I used to have long rows of film annuals from the US, big thick ones, from France, thin paperbacks, from Germany, from Italy, from everywhere else I could get them because those are the only ones who would give me credits for that year's uh, product productions. and. Uh, Kitty would come over and uh, ask me, you know, who did the, the costume design and the Garbo features in the late 1930s? And she'd name three or four films. Well, I'd go back to these individual volumes and look it up because that's the only place you got those credits. You couldn't get them from anywhere else. And if you were working with a contemporary filmmaker, say when I was a film critic, uh, the um, uh, film company would send you a little bio in their press kit. But if the filmmaker didn't like one of his films, they just leave it out, you know, and it was completely inaccurate information. So I was always scrambling around in my library trying to keep things together. Now, I forget off the top of my head which I think it was an Alec Guinness season that she did at the museum, and she asked me to write the film notes for her. So I wrote film notes to each of the, I think, eight Alec Guinness films that she ran. And we got to know each other, and then she started asking me for help and for material. And then um, somebody else did a season but wanted to do the interview with the celebrity but not the notes to the film. So she asked me what I fill in with those. I did that. Then something else happened. So I worked with the, the system a little bit. And at one point, after I had been three or four years at that, while I was doing other things, um, Kitty White was made a trustee of the Museum of Fine Arts. As a trustee, she couldn't have a hand on a working program. She couldn't work with the staff anymore. So she went up to the board as a trustee. And the head of the education department, who was um, uh, uh, who knew me as well, um, uh, came over to the house one, one night and said, would you take on the job of being film coordinator because Kitty White can't do this work anymore? So I said, sure. And that's how I got that job. And I knew the program pretty well, and I knew what was going on. They knew me a little bit. And um, I stayed there for 13 years. I stayed there for so long, I mean, partly because of interesting work. It was a pr pr fantastic you know, uh, art museum. It's the second largest art museum in the United States after the Metropolitan in New York. And they had a good film program uh, up, and, up and running that did some really interesting stuff. But I stayed there so long in part because I got a little bit trapped. Um, there wasn't anything else for me to do. I wasn't about to quit, you know, and just kind of become a freelancer again. I knew I wasn't very good at freelancing. And while I was there, two jobs became available for doing pretty much the same thing in other American museums. Maybe a little better, better budget, maybe not. And I looked at those jobs, but I never applied for them because I thought I'd be trading an institution where I knew the institution inside and out, where I had good support of the board from Kitty White, for a situation I didn't even know who the players were and know what was going on and what the prospects were. And it was all going to be moving level, 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 level. So I didn't, so I stayed. But I was getting pretty uncomfortable there after a while. Um, it hadn't been 
it hadn't been always a positive experience and it hadn't been something that was I knew was going to grow or work in a little bit. The one thing that I did at the Museum of Fine Arts that I was very pleased about is that I set up an endowment for them for the film program. And that took two years of argument. In the, there were two endowments. One was a gift of Kitty White to the program. She was just fanatically interested in film. I mean, just really complete. She was a graduate of Vassar College and in the 19, early 1930s now. And already that's unusual because there are not that many women taking college degrees. She found out that the Museum of Modern Art was about to open in New York City. So she went over to their office, William Barr's office, and said, I want to join up. You're going to have a film department. And Barr told her that um, the film department was going to open three or four years after the rest of the museum opened, which it did. Um, because they had to find the right person to run it, and it was lower on their list. It was part of their original charter, but it was lower on their list of priorities. And sorry, but the only uh, job we have open is a um, switchboard operator, but there's no work here. And, you know, he's talking, after all, to a high society Boston lady of quite proper dimensions uh, who's just recently graduated from Vassar with a good degree. I mean, she's going to go and do anything she wants to do. She went home after that talk with uh, Mr. Barr and called her brother. Her brother was a lawyer with a big law firm in, in New York City, big corporate law firm in New York City. And she said, do you have a switchboard? And he said, well, of course we have a switchboard. We're a big law firm in New York City. He says, I'm coming over. Get somebody to teach me how to run it. Yeah, well, he knew his sister, and he knew his sister was not, it was a little strange. Well, okay, fine. So she goes over to his law firm the next day and sits down with a switchboard operator and two of his lawyer friend, you know, two lawyers, including her, her brother, to learn how to run the switchboard operator. She learns how to run the switchboard. She goes back to the Museum of Modern Art, says, I'm applying for the job as a switchboard operator. They hired her as a switchboard operator. So she becomes a switchboard operator and she learned, knows how to run this little, it was a small office but at that day, it wasn't really complicated. And she waited out a year or two or three, whatever it was, until Iris Barry was hired to run the film department, at which point she turned to Iris Barry and said, I want to work with you, and left the switchboard and became the first employee of the Museum of Modern Art on, in the film department under Iris Barry. So I'll backtrack here for a minute because I'll go back to Kitty White looking for credits for her film notes at the museum. And you know, she, she was persistent. You know, she just never let go. She just never let anything go. And at some point, she came up with a season for she was running, something that was outside my library. So I couldn't find the material or anything else. And so I said to her at one point, total frustration, she wanted information I couldn't have. I said, call David Shepard. He said, he knows everything about them. He'll tell you the answer to your questions. So I gave her David's phone number. He was then in Davenport, Iowa, running Black Hawk Films, because he had taken over Black, Black, Black Hawk, guy who owned Black Hawk Films was aging and getting older, and he brought in David to be the new life and a little bit more energy in the, in the company. He later died, and, and, and David ended up, with, ended up with the company, Black Hawk Films. So nothing much happened, and I think life went on, and things were busy. And Six months later, half a year, three quarters of a year later, um, I hear that Kitty White has kind of been calling David a lot about, you know, no more credits and more information so she can get her data right and one thing and another. She had been after him a lot, which I didn't realize, but I should have known better because she just was that persistent. And I got on the phone to David one day and I said, David, I'm really sorry to, you know, have sicked Kitty White on you. You know, she can be very, very persistent and very irresistible. I said, you know, uh, I, I apologize. I didn't realize that this was going to become a lifelong involvement for you. 
And David said to me down the telephone, he says, Kitty White, don't you know about Kitty White? I said, no. Well, Kitty White, she said, he said she was the first member of staff at the Museum of Modern Art in the film. This is the first I had ever heard of it. She had never mentioned it. She, had a, he, she said, she's the one who found Billy Bitzer over in um, New Jersey, alcoholic and out of sorts and down on the heels completely, got him cleaned up, got him, brought him over to New York City, to the museum, went through all the biograph bulletins with him and got him to identify all the players that he remembered. He said, I would do anything in the world for Kitty White. So that's how I found out a little bit more about Kitty White. You know? and so in the end, when she became a trustee, she couldn't run a program, and I got that I, I was her successor. Uh, right. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm jumping a little bit again now. Um, while you were doing the work at the Fine Arts in Boston, you also lectured, I think, at Tufts University, um, and you became a trustee for a Flatty seminar. What's that? Well, there's two stories there. Um, I think I started at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts a year after I was on their fac on the on the staff of the museum itself. A little bit unusual, but uh, I knew the guys at the at the uh, museum school a little bit, the filmmakers over there, and they wanted their their art history department needed somebody to teach history of film. So it was an interview process, and I was chosen after they interviewed three or four, three or four people for that job. And that meant that I was a full-time employee at the museum and a one day a week or one afternoon a week employee at the, at the, uh, at the museum school. Uh, so I stayed there for just about as long as I stayed at the, at the museum itself. And I just loved it. Uh, I, all art students, it's one of the oldest art schools in America. It then and now, as far as I know, never gave a degree. It gave a certificate, which meant that it wasn't in anybody's overview to say what they could teach and couldn't teach and one thing or another. It was all very open. And their student body was slightly older than um, normal for an art school because giving the certificate, what the Museum of Fine Arts School was trying to do was to train artists. You would leave the museum school after five or six years. There are a couple of extra programs you could take as a painter, a sculptor, a printmaker, whatever, a jeweler. Um, and you were expected to work in that profession as an independent standing artist. They were never teaching and never did teach um, art education, art therapy, art, any, art technique, anything else. They wanted to do artists. So the museum school had a little program for those who wanted a college degree that taught academic subjects that you could take and you got a degree from the museum school and from Tufts University. And the faculty that I joined at the museum school was the art history faculty actually paid by Tufts University. And they were the branch of the art history department at Tufts, but only taught on the campus of the museum school. So that's where that all came from. And it was a brilliant job. Artists have such vision. I mean, some of them are crazy. Some of them are not academically oriented at all either. But the ones that are interested and have such vision, you could really teach film the way film should be taught. I, I enjoyed that more than almost anything anything else that, that I could do. And that's where the Tufts Association came from, was all at, the, all at the museum school. What was the second part of that question? Flaherty Seminar. Oh, the Flaherty Seminar. I started going to the Flaherty Seminar is an interesting seminar. It's a week-long series of films in production, not yet released, in still in flux, 
uh, documentary films that was started by Robert Flaherty's widow in, on their farm in Brattleboro, Vermont. And over the years, that grew into a seminar that was really quite famous in documentary fields and it's still running. It's even expanded even more now. It's got an office in New York City and it does things during the year, during the year programming in New York City. The week long seminar itself is still um, uh, the core of their uh, operations and much more elaborate than when, when I was around. And I started going and I one thing or another and I enjoyed going and somebody asked me if I would join their board and I said yes and I joined their board and I was on that board until the year after I moved to Los Angeles because I had to leave all my East Coast uh, associations behind. I didn't have the resources to just to fly around anywhere I wanted to and go to meetings. And uh, I'm very proud of that work because uh, it, it was a really interesting way of looking at new documentary films. And what happens at the seminar is unique. Some people talk about it as a festival of documents, and it is. What happens, though, is unique. In the old days, when I was there, there was, somebody was the programmer, and this was usually some kind of senior person or experienced person in documentary or educational films or film exhibition or something like that. I had a little bit of a foot in several of those areas. They asked me one year to be the programmer. The programmer, chosen in September, let's say, for an August uh, seminar, spends the rest of the year looking at 100, maybe 150, maybe 200 different documentary films in production, not yet released, semi-finished, whatever, and chooses the right number of films by running time that will fill up the week of, well, the, week of the seminar. Screening in the morning, screening in the afternoon, screening at night. And what's different than a festival is that the seminar is always held in some isolated place where you can't get off campus or you can't get out of the building. And everybody eats together. Everybody stays in the same place. Everybody sees all the films. So there's, while there are people who are friends and have friends, and one, there's no um, cliques because Everybody's talking about the same films, everybody's seeing the same films, and it's a kind of a really interesting, unusual social process that goes through, where from a week that starts on Saturday evening, by Wednesday or Thursday of the following week, there's almost always a revolt against the programmer. They want his head, they want his neck, they want, they're fed up with the whole process. And that happens year after year after year. So it's a recognizable psychological phenomenon. Because the programmer who has chosen all of the films to fill up the week, the right number of films, never says what the next screening is gonna be. Only the programmer knows the body of work, nobody else. And only the, film, only the programmer chooses, I'll show this one today, that one tomorrow, and this one tonight. And you, you choose that based on the quality of discussion in the previous session. Now, almost always, all of the filmmakers are also present. About 120 people are there in the old days. So out of 120 people, maybe 40 of them or 35 of them are actually the filmmakers. So they're talking like crazy. When's my film coming? Well, they don't know either, but they're all talking to, I've got a film, I've got my films on that, and they're all talking about each other's films, and that works, that uh, discussion spreads throughout the seminar, which means that some people in the seminar want to see this one right away and don't want to see that one, but they never know what one is going to come up next because that's a secret, which is why the revolt happens on Thursday. Um, because they haven't seen what they want to see yet, or whatever. But the process is really interesting. I've been to a lot of film festivals. At film festivals, you go to the festival, you go to the main screenings, 
Afterwards, you meet your friends that you already know. You go off to a restaurant that somebody recommends that everybody know, and you come back. If it's a really interesting discussion, you miss the next screening. If not, you go back and you look re religiously at the next screening. But then when you come back out, you only get to see the people you already know. The compression and the communication between all of the Flaherty Seminar people, all 120 of them, it just doesn't allow you to do that. Nobody ever gets to leave the seminar and go into town to the good restaurant that somebody told them about that they can afford that nobody else can afford and eats a different meal. It just doesn't happen. And therefore, it's not a festival, and I think it's quite distinct from a festival, but it's a fantastic consuming learning experience about documentary film. And that's how it started because when Robert Flaherty died, his widow invited some of his pupils, some of the people who had worked with him, the Maisels brothers, Ricky Leacock, one or two other people, to come back to the farm with their uncompleted films that they were working on, show them to each other, discuss them for a few days, and then go back to New York City or wherever else they came from went on. And with the death of Flaherty's widow, his three daughters, um, three children took over the seminar and took it. And then at some point they institutionalized it because they just weren't, it got a little bit too big for them just to handle and pay for every year alone out of their own, out of their own resources. Um, so that's how it came about. And it really kept that spirit alive, I think, for at least the next 30, 30 years. I don't, I haven't been to a Flaherty seminar since 1986 or 87, something like that. I do get their newsletter and I do, I'm still in touch with them. Uh, every few days, every couple of weeks, another email comes in on one topic or another. So I know a little bit about what's going on, a little bit about how it's changed. But I haven't been there, so I can't, no, don't know how the experience has changed. Yeah, uh, at Bologna, they will be showing Moana. I think, I'm not sure if one of the daughters is still alive, but uh, her version of Moana with a soundtrack. And there's, that will be a discussion plus the film show. I, I can tell I can tell you a little bit about that version because I know about that, and it's 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 interesting. It's a great story, um, and I'm hearing this direct from Ricky Leacock. What happened was that the Flaherty seminar and the people behind Flaherty, there's now a board. There's a couple. There's a, now a television seminar as well. There's a couple of other things going on. Um, raised enough money to send Ricky Leacock and one of the daughters, a surviving daughter, uh, out to the um, uh, Samoan Islands to see if they could put a soundtrack onto uh, Moana. So there th was an authentic soundtrack. And they thought that the, the whole project was uh, with the idea that, with the idea that um, there was a good um, uh, imprimatur by having Ricky, who had been Flaherty's main pupil, after all, on the Louisiana story, uh, do it, and he was willing to do it, one thing or another, and he knew the daughters, and they were all, one thing or another. So they get them some money together. They so get all the way out to the Samoan Islands, which are in the middle of nowhere. This is the middle of the Pacific. It's like 4,000 miles to the next island, not even to a country where they've got resources, but to the next island. And Ricky's brought a Nagra recorder with him, and they find a couple of people who are still alive who sang some of the Samoan songs in Moana, and they um, uh, met, and I don't know whether the daughter, I think the daughter might have been seven or eight when they was there, so they knew the, knew the daughter, recognized the daughter, but they found, and so they could record some of the same songs again and one thing or another. The problem was that the second day they're in Samoa, a million miles from anything, they get into a boat and go out into a little bay, which is where part of the film takes place, and Ricky starts recording, you know, room sound, you know, he starts recording room tone, the kind of atmosphere there. He drops the Nagra reporter into the sea, out of the boat. I don't know how, but he did it himself. He told me he did it himself. It sits now seven feet underwater, 
crystal clear water on a clear uh, sandy bottom. So he jumps out of the boat and he picks it up and he puts it back in a boat and it, it leaks water from everywhere. That was the end of the Nagra recorder. I mean, you know, and they have no repair shop, no thing. He had bought a, brought a second recorder with him just because he was a smart guy. But the big one's gone, and so now they're going to record all this, and they did, on the substitute recorder, which was a decently professional, but just kind of more or less consumer machine. So they got something done while they were all there. They put a soundtrack on it, and of course, Flaherty uh, itself copyrighted that um, soundtrack and material so they could kind of keep a hold of Moana as it went on. My wind band that I play with is now rehearsing Moana from the Disney uh, film. And we played that at a concert for children in Dulwich a couple of weeks ago. We're going to play it again in a couple of weeks at Borough Market. And every time we get out the music, I turn to my saxophone player who sits next to me and say, wrong film. And she, of course, has never seen Flaherty's Moana, has no idea about Flaherty's Moana. Oh, it's very, you've got to see the film. It's really great. I said, I'm not going to see the film. I know the real Moana. No way. <laughs> Every week, I'll, I'll Thursday night, it'll be a rehearsal again. We'll rehearse it undoubtedly. It'll come out. I'll say, oh, wrong film. <laughs> Nobody, uh, we're old enough now, uh, I think both of us, I can say, uh, that not that many people remember, remember anything about silent films anymore. I mean, they were around in one way or another when I was growing up. And they were around for sure once I found out what they really were and I could look at them. You could, the, when I was a film critic, the uh, film companies used to fly us down to New York to meet different celebrities and do stuff on newly released films. You know, junkets, right, for the press. It was easier for the film company because they could get somebody to fly in from Hollywood and stay there for three days and, you know, et cetera. But they didn't have to get, send them around to Boston, Cleveland, Philadelphia, you know, et cetera. Really, I read meets in New York. Maybe you should get your wind band to play to the silent version of Moana. Well, well, I mean, I'd love to, but that's not, that's not no, no one, in the, n not a single person in that band is going to know the real Moana. <laughs> not a single one. And everybody knows how successful it was with the children in Dulwich for the Dulwich Festival because they all saw the film, you know, it's a, and they all know the tunes. In any case, I say one th more thing, that, that when I was a film critic, the, they would send us on these junkets. So I, I would go, I have to write them up. You know, that was part of my job. But the real pleasure of going to New York was that New York City television was on all night long. And in the middle of the night, New York City television had a couple of really important early silent film, or silent film, not early silent film, but silent film shows. So you could watch these guys and watch slapstick comedies you know, for hours between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. You get an hour's worth of sleep and you go down and kind of sleep through some celebrity interview and go back and write it up and everybody was happy. That's fantastic. But the real, the real pleasure of going to New York was television stations in Boston quit broadcasting at one o'clock. That was it. They had a late show or a late film and that was it. They didn't stay on all night. New York could stay up. Yeah. 15 years you were on the board of directors for the Ford Hall Forum in Boston. What did that entail? The Ford Hall Forum is the oldest public lecture series in the United States of America that has operated continuously since the day it was founded in, God knows, 1905 until yesterday afternoon. They have a series of lectures every academic year, September, October through May, April, May. Slightly more, slightly less, depending on how their finances are running. And they discuss contemporary issues in a fair-minded and balanced way. And the, uh, the forum's really quite, quite famous for people who like to go to lectures. Um, there's an old joke about Bostonians who die and who reach the pearly gates and St. Peter sits there 
And there are two doors behind St. Peter. One says heaven. The other says lectures on heaven. And all the Bostonians go through the <laughs> door that says lectures on heaven. And well-known Boston um, humor. The Fort Hall Forum is a live uh, debate, a live, you know, a speaker makes a presentation, there are lots of questions afterwards, it's usually a two-hour session where an hour or slightly less is speaker and an hour and slightly more are questions. There's therefore a moderator for that outfit. Now, I was, I spoke at the forum on a panel on the contemporary arts with three other people when I was 25 or whatever it was, I was quite young. And sometime the year or two after that, one of the people on the forum board asked myself and a guy from uh, uh, WGBH radio, public radio in Boston, to join the board. We did. We both accepted. When we joined, we were the first new people to join that board in 17 years. This was an old board, it was a stable board, it was dying, and there you were. So we joined the board. One of the board members was a Superior Court of Massachusetts judge named Reuben Lurie. And Judge Lurie had been moderating the sessions at the forum forever. Uh, the moderator introduced the speaker, let the speaker speak, then took a microphone up to the front of the stands and said all our questions and pointed who would have a question. The moderator then repeated the question because the sessions were always broadcast live on WGBH radio and you had to have the microphone to do it. We didn't have people running around with microphones. They weren't that mobile in, the, in those days. so. The speaker would repeat the question as asked, which not only gave the radio audience the idea of what was being said in the hall, but also gave the speaker then just a minute to, or a moment, to kind of shape their thoughts. At the age of 70-something, I don't know exactly what age, Reuben Lurie decided he was going to retire from the, he had already retired from the bench, he was now going to retire from the forum as well. And for reasons unknown to me, he, he appointed me as the moderator for the forum, which the rest of the board accepted. We all knew each other and thought we were stable people. And for the next 11 or 12 years, whatever it was, un until I left Boston, I moderated every single meeting of the Ford Hall Forum. So whether that was, you know, um, a politician, an academic, a celebrity, I mean, Jimmy Breslin, um, I don't know what names come to, come to mind, but a huge number of people who had something to say about an issue. Because the Ford Hall Forum always presented issues, issues of, the, of the day. Um, Margaret Sanger, if you may remember the name, the uh, great feminist speaker and advocate of, of, um, of um, uh, public uh, uh, parent planning, Margaret Sanger, spoke at the forum in 1934 or 35, and the mayor of Boston said she'd be arrested if she was, gave her speech on uh, birth control. And, you know, the forum thought about that for a while, and they went right ahead with the meeting where Margaret Sanger's speech was read by the president of the forum, and Margaret sat next to him in a chair, bound and gagged. <laughs> but her speech was delivered, because the forum believed in free speech. And that's what they did. And we had some really interesting sessions there. The, the thing probably to say is that one of the people who thought that the forum was one of the last major repositories of American true liberalism, old-fashioned liberalism, that is, was a woman uh, who had written a couple of books called Ayn Rand, uh, The Fountainhead, and a couple of other books that she wrote. And she had a kind of a cult uh, running around 
all of whom wore little dollar signs in their lapels. And for her particular philosophy, which is what fills the books, the books are huge and they're, they go on forever because she's telling people how to think and what they're supposed to do and one thing or another. Ayn Rand stopped speaking in public in 1974, 75, whatever. She just gave it up completely. But she came once a year to the forum because she thought this was one of the few places that had been honest about its balanced presentation of issues. And the forum invited her every year. As a member of the board, we said we don't really invite people to come every year. That's not what we do because of the different issues. On the one hand. On the other hand, she sold out the 2,500 seat hall in about 15 minutes. People traveled from all over the United States, some from foreign countries, just to hear what she had to say that year. A huge part of the membership was financially important to the forum. So it was a debate every year and every year we invited her. That meant that I moderated public speeches by Ayn Rand for like eight years in a row. And which is more than I did anybody else because everybody else was on some kind of rotation or here and there. Some people would appear a second time, of course. But, you know, Madeleine Albright came when she was Secretary of State, but not again, you know, this kind of stuff. So I was warned by Judge Lurie, who had been doing this, uh, when the, she came up the first time, he said, she's going to try and find out what you think and whether or not you agree with her. Don't let her know. That's not the that's not the, the 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 moderator's job. The moderator's job is to moderate and be fair. And she did right away. We're sitting in the green room. We said, well, what do you think of the, of the situation? I don't particularly. And we ended up having gotten familiar with each other over a long period of time, talking about our cats. So <laughs> every year, Ayn Rand would come to Boston, give her speech. People would be banging down the doors to get into that speech, all of them less interesting than all the others. And she and I would be sitting in the green room talking about our cats. So. Jumping ahead here, well, maybe not jumping ahead, but on the East Coast, you were involved in three films between 1961 and 1986. One was called Rambo's Season in Hell. I think you were co-director. Um, which I think was a 60-minute twin screen film. Yeah. You were involved in producing a, fi a film, Tell Me That You Love Me, with Liza Minnelli, directed by Otto Preminger. And the third film we were technical advisor on was a documentary of the painter, Paul Cadmus. Can you tell me something about these three films? They're all different different stories. The the uh, Rambo season in hell was a project that um, myself and an art student at Syracuse did um, while we were undergraduates. Um, the the real motivator of that project was Juris Eubanes, who was a brilliant uh, artist, a wonderful painter ended up in Portland, Maine, and uh, as a painter and as a teacher at the University of Maine for many, many years and retired uh, some years ago from that, from that job. And this was quite an avant-garde uh, project, as you, as you note, um, because of Rambo, because he, Rambo died young and early. Um, it was the era of experimental film, mid-60s. Uh, so we did a double twin screen presentation, shot all kinds of material to get up on the screen. And uh, Lenny, I forget his name, Lenny, whatever his name was, did a, did a, did a, a soundtrack for, for the film for us with two quarter-tone pianos, as used by uh, Charles Ives, amongst others, and avant-garde instrumentation in one thing or another. And we showed the film a couple of times, and that was more or less it. It was a great thing. Juris Eubanes was a refugee from Latvia, uh, who got out during, whose family got out during World War II, uh, when you could get out of those kinds of uh, USSR enclaves. And he and his mother, he was a late child, he had two older siblings, um, settled in Syracuse and 
when he went to art school there, but he went to art school in the GI Bill. He had already been in the American Army before that. So he was, if I was 21 or 22 when we made that film, he was like 27. You know, he was half a generation older um, and a brilliant character. The um, Tell Me That You Love Me, Juni Mood was a project that I got into while I was a journalist at the newspaper. Otto Preminger came to town and did an interview, and I did an, I did an interview with him. And one thing, and I got to meet a couple of his people. He went out of town. Then he came back a couple of years later to make a, this film uh, from Marjorie Kellogg's novel, uh, Tell Me That You Love Me, Junie Moon, about three people, each of one who has a particular disability, none of the three being able to live on their own, but as a group, between the three of them, they lived perfectly well and could have a perfectly capable, competent life. He shot the film off, up on Cape Ann, uh, north of, um, of, of um, Boston, mostly in the area around Marion, Massachusetts, uh, in a couple of, different, couple of different locations. And when he came back to town, Otto, who has a remarkable track record that I don't think anybody's really recognized of working with youth and giving stepping stones to youth and to new actors, actually. He's really been very good at bringing actors into the film business that had not had previous experience. Tom Tryon, lots of people who went, went through Otto. Set up a, a, a system um, this was 1969, the year after um, um, Easy Rider, and the year in which Hollywood more or less discovered the youth audience. And he set up a system where he would promote the making of nine short films about the making of Tell Me That You Love Me, Junie Moon by nine different uh, filmmakers from who, whoever applied, chosen from the people who applied. He'd support the um, cost of the film, uh, the film and the developing. The filmmakers would have to supply their own camera and, and lens and time. And he'd provide access to the set so they could shoot around the making of the film. And he asked me to be in charge of that project. So I ran that project for him, top to bottom. I chose the filmmakers. I confirmed access with the ADs. Every time somebody wanted to visit the set, I dealt with problems, um, et cetera. And we, um, all nine films got completed. When they were completed, I went down to New York City to um, uh, uh, show them to Otto. By the time I got down to New York City and showed him the films, he had decided he wanted something else and didn't like any of them. So that was the end of the project. In the meantime, um, he shot in, in, um, in Boston for 14 weeks, 16 weeks. Then he went to Florida, and I was, went back to work, and I was going to and I got told, no, I've got to go to Florida with him because I'm now a part of that unit, so he took me to Florida. And I, I mean, I double checked, and that's what was going to happen. So I'll take a trip to Florida and was part of the crew. And I knew a lot of people on working there, and some of the actors and the people on his staff I knew. And um, that was fine until he decided to close up in Florida and go to California. People don't realize that Otto Preminger is a really honest man. Florida for the cameraman's union is a double jurisdiction. If you have a New York City camera crew, you can work in Florida. If you have a West Coast camera crew, you can work in Florida. If you take a New York City extra on, just paying somebody for not doing anything because it's a duplication of effort. Otto had a New York City cameraman named Boris Kaufman. Boris Kaufman, amongst other things, was Zygi Vertov's younger brother. 
and a brilliant cameraman. He had been the cameraman on all the Jean Vigo films. He had been the cameraman on Long Day's Journey into Night. He had been the cameraman on um, um, Ilya Kazan's uh, On the Waterfront, won an Academy Award. He was a really fantastic guy. I really liked Boris a lot. I mean, I really fell in love with this guy. He was just fun and super good cameraman who had a clause in his contract, actually, thanks to his wife. His wife ran their lives, the two of them. But his wife had inserted in his contract that if Otto Preminger ever yelled at him, he could quit. <laughs> so every time Otto, who has a temper, saw something he didn't like or something that wasn't his way, either one, didn't make any difference, not his way, didn't like it, and started and drew a deep breath to turn and yell at Boris, he swiveled and yelled at the next person he could see. <laughs> and it just went on several times. It was really fun, very funny. You know, and that guy took a blast, you know, for un, un, inexplicable reasons. No way. Really. In any case, in Florida, Otto refused to hire the extra guys from the local Florida union because he said, I've got a New York cameraman. And the union said, you've got a New York cameraman, but the rest of your crew is from the West Coast. Since they're from the West Coast, you've got to hire us. And Otto said, that's not the way the, the jurisdiction is written. Yeah, OK. So it was a question of arguing, of either caving in to these predators and paying off somebody to do no work at full scale, or quitting and leaving. Otto quit and left. Nobody thought he would do this because in those days you quit. You had two or three semi-trailer tractor tractor trailers, HGVs with all the equipment in it. They had to drive all the way to California. You and your crew flew out to California. You had to rearrange the schedule of all the actors that were supposed to appear in the last few scenes. Then you had to find new locations. So he quit, and all of a sudden I found myself on a plane to California. I was still a part of the crew. I got a ticket. I'm in California, I'm seeing Hollywood for the first time. Now, a couple things happened out of that. I won't bore you with long stories here, but um, we finished the film in California and had some interesting conversations. And mostly, I spent every day in Otto Preminger's office in, on the lot at Paramount Pictures and looked around Paramount a little bit and Otto made a couple of arrangements for me, but also mostly just chatting with him to keep him interested and not have him go wild. The film got finished. Otto paid me off most of what it is, was that he owed me because that was the end of the film, that was the end of that budget, and I got several hundred dollars extra to my salary in California. I took that money over to Larry Edmonds' bookshop, dropped it all on the counter, and started picking books off the shelves, which they could ship to me afterwards, which they did, which was a huge part of my, one huge part of my early cinema library, because I bought a whole bunch of stuff. Some of those books are now at, um, at Goldsmith's. You know the um, Cinema d'Aujourd'hui, the little French paperbacks? Right. Yeah, that whole series. I had all 58 of them from one to 58, most of which I got at Larry Edmonds. They're just sitting there. Nobody was interested in them. But again, I'm after credits, because if you wanted some, to know about Howard Hawks, there's a book on Howard Hawks in that series. And you've got credits in all the films after it, but it didn't exist anywhere else. So I'm defending my own profession here by buying these books, so I say. The entire Cinema d'Aujourd'hui series now is over at Goldsmiths. I gave them all and a lot of other stuff that I don't use very much to Goldsmiths about 10 years ago. It's in the Goldsmiths Library in a special collection. So that was Tell Me That You Love Me, Juni Moon. The uh, Paul Cadmus documentary was another story because I knew a local filmmaker, a really, really brilliant filmmaker, just a local guy. Uh, I'll think of his name in a minute named David something, who had gotten thrown out of um, the University of San Diego, no, or University of California, San Francisco. Where was Sesiu Hayak where was Hayakawa, the guy, famous guy who, instead of 
putting up with student protests in 1968 closed the university uh, completely. You know, quite famous right-wing university president in the U.S. David was at his um, university, and he kind of got caught in this situation uh, completely. So he never finished this degree, but he it was supposed to be a film degree. He was a film student. He was a brilliant filmmaker. He had an eye better than anybody else. I saw a little short film that he made somewhere in Boston uh, about a diner, and I really loved it, and I told him I loved it. He was, I think, at the screening I was at, and we became semi-friends. He knew I was a supporter of his work. He knew I knew about film, one thing or another. Paul Cadmus was his first real film, a 16 millimeter biographical documentary on um, a very, very well-known artist who was something of a recluse and really who was hard to get to. But David got to him and he agreed and he did, and he did this film on Paul Cadmus. Because it was his first real film, his father ran a, a tire company in, in, in Boston, on, on, in Cambridge, on, on the banks of the Charles River, World Tire, and just had a, you know, a lot of stuff. And David had to work with his father's company, like his older brother did. No interest whatsoever, wanted to make films. Because this was his first real film, he hired in to edit the film an editor from the National Geographic series, from the National Geographic documentaries, based in Pittsburgh, which is where they were mostly, where they were made and where they were broadcast, the public radio station, that, the public television station that, that generated the um, uh, National Geographic materials guy, was a station in Pittsburgh. So this guy comes up to do the editing, and, the, and what happened was that at some point, the editor and David, both of whom were completely stubborn and really had tempers, both of them, got into a huge fight over a particular sequence in that film. And they fought and they fought and they fought. No resolution in sight. Somebody said, let's call Deke and he can settle which the fight between us and which way it should be edited and what's going on. And the guy from Philadelphia agreed, having heard about whatever, for whatever reason. So I went out there and I see the film and I see the sequence and I look at it and I think about what's going on and I kind of suggest a, a, a solution that gets everybody out of the blind alley they've driven themselves down and like that. And, um, they both agreed that it was a good suggestion, and I got a credit. <laughs> That's what happened. But I also got credit on, on at least one of David's next films. He made a couple more films on artists, and at least one of them I got a credit because I got, gave some more advice about staying out of arguments and how to fix things. When did you meet Henri Longuois? Was that on the East Coast or not? That was on the East Coast. That's a wonderful story. You, you and I have told enough stories. That some, you got some interesting things out, out of this. I, um, I used to go, when I was a journalist in Boston, I used to go to the New York Film Festival every year. It was the, the big film festival in the U.S. in those days. There were no comparators at all. It was not so far away. My boss thought it was a good idea that we had reports from the New York Film Festival. So in 1968, I go down to the... Lincoln Center, it's in the Lincoln Center facilities, which is used by the New York Film Festival. And I'm wandering around a little bit, and I'm looking at the little stands in the lobby of the theater and here and there, and, and going to the films. And I had already seen that on the program this year was a big season of silent films as new discoveries from the American Film Institute. They had 20 films, feature films, and they were all being aired in public for the first time in 40 years, 45 years. And the program was assembled and run by David Shepard, because David was, for a short period of time, uh, the main collector of films for the American Film Institute and worked with Sam Kula at the American Film Institute Archive. The American Film Institute really wouldn't put Dave quite in charge of everything because he was a collector and he was a little dodgy and you never knew exactly what the provenance was of anything. But so Sam watched over him like a hawk and had and had to, believe me. 
But this was a good program that they had collected from different places. And David was there, and I'm walking around the lobby one day, and I, I bump into him. I said, oh, David, how are you? What's going on? Okay, fine. We, we had a little chat, a little catch-up. How are things in critic, film critic business, et cetera? And I was seeing the films in the, in the, in the theater. And I remember that film comment an occasional publication, a long-standing film journal, but only came out kind of sporadically because it wasn't very well financed, had a guy the name of Gordon somebody or other who had just written yet again one of his long articles for the magazine on great lost films of all time. This was one of the guys who had been around forever and seen a lot and, you know, was willing, as the game used to be played in the old days, to brag about films that he knew about that had been lost, but that had been lost that nobody else could ever see. And we walked past his stand. The guy was at the film comment stand at that point. And David says to me, turns to me, says, oh, he says, Gordon's list of the great lost films, very much like my list of recent acquisitions, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which was kind of half true, but, you know, that's what collectors did, and they were all on thing. And David said, oh, there's Henri Langlois. Oh, we're standing over in a corner, a little bit 200 yards beyond where we're looking in the stands, is Henri Langlois. And David says, let's go over and say hello. So, fine with me, I knew who Henri Langlois was, but it's, you know, he's a long way away you know, <laughs> from me. So we go over and David knows Henri Langlois, of course, he's trading with him, he's doing all kinds of things. And he introduces me, and I shake hands with Langlois, and we talk, chat for a minute. And then David goes off to talk to somebody else. He sees another part of the, another part of the lobby, and I'm standing there with Langlois, who turns to me and says, hmm, you're from Boston? Yes. Why don't you start a little cinematheque? I will send you some films. Now, this is the most dangerous sentence that anybody can ever answer. I'm very young, I'm quite ambitious, or I'm partly ambitious, and, but I know from what I know about the archive world, a little bit already, from David, from Jim Card, from others, that when Henri Langlois says that and says he'll send some films, he's very unreliable. He probably will send some films. They may not be the films you ask for. They may not come at the time you were promised, but he'll send something. But watch out for getting in business with this guy because he just is, he remembers, he forgets, he changes his mind, he, whatever. So I say, well, thank you very much, Arnold. That's a great offer. But I said, I'm really not in the cinematic business. I'm a critic and I've got a good job at the newspaper. And that. But I'll think about it a little bit and we can talk at some other point. End of story. I never saw him again. <laughs> but I, I can say I actually met Henri Langlois, and he offered to lend me some films to start a cinematheque. It's true. Now I'm throwing a few names at you now, which I've got written here as possible interviews. Um, let me know. Robert Altman, Cassavetes, Fellini, Hitchcock, Jean Moreau, Jack Nicholson, Otto Preminger you mentioned, Eric Romare, and Truffaut. Did you interview any of these? All of them. Which ones stick in your well, mind? Well, I mean, you, you know, I, you can... <sighs> they all stick in my mind. They were all great. Hitchcock was a fantastic storyteller and just told fantastic stories and, and, and told them properly. I mean, told them in a way that they made sense and made a good story. I can't repeat them because I don't tell stories as, as well as he, he did. John Cassavetes was um, uh, really, he, he, made a, he made a film called Faces, which was his second or third feature film, I think. And um, I reviewed it. I liked it a lot. Uh, I gave it a good review. He came up to Boston at some point. We sat in a little taverna and, and uh, had a drink together. Um, and he ordered ouzo, and he looked at me, Deke, you, you ever have ouzo? No, I've never had ouzo. Oh, bring it as ouzo for Deke. Yes, I well, okay, fine. And he ultimately, um, that has a story has two ends, uh, ultimately um, 
used my review from the newspaper in Boston in an ad in the New York Times. It was the first time I was review quoted in the New York Times. And that was a big thing for me back then, get the phrase in De Grossel, Boston After Dark. Because I liked the film and that made it sense. Sadly, um, in 1988, I did his memorial service at the Directors Guild. Um, the Directors Guild will from time to time do a memorial service at the Guild for the members as an official um, ceremony uh, if, the, if the, 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 the member is a prominent enough filmmaker and he had died while I was there. And it was the special projects director, me in those days, that did all the funerals and also had the job of telling the widows, mostly, of other members that their late departed dear husband was really not going to get a memorial from the Directors Guild because he was not prominent enough and was not on our list to do that, which was very, very hard work. Um, but you got, to, you got to do the ones for Frank Schaffner or whomever, and you got to turn down all the ones that didn't get done. So you don't get the one without the other. It's not always easy, easy sailing. Did John, John Huston as well, did you? His, yes, I did, John Huston. And, and there is maybe a little bit of a story there. Um, I went to work at the Directors Guild in 1987. <laughs> whatever date it was, my first day in the office was Monday. My, and I'm, my first day in the office is Monday. It's my second day in Hollywood. I've never lived in Los Angeles. You know, I'm an East Coast guy. Um, I know my way around film a, a good bit, not everything, but a good bit. And on Monday, I go into the office. I have a staff of three in, in, in Los Angeles at that time. And one of my staff members says, you're going to meet tomorrow with Angelica Houston and her two brothers uh, because on Saturday there'll be a memorial service for John Houston. And um, you'll set up the whole service tomorrow in that meeting. That was all done. He had died over the weekend. They had a, the family had a very, very small, very close-knit um, um, ceremony for him in Mexico, uh, where he where he had died, and that was it. But they also felt that something needed to be done in Hollywood because they had so many friends there and so much going on, and um, that was the Tuesday meeting. So from Tuesday until Saturday, my first week in a new job in a new place in a new building in a new city. I did nothing but work out clips and materials and, uh, and this and that and everything else for, for John Huston's uh, memorial, which was compared by uh, Jack Nicholson. So Jack Nicholson gets uh, also a double, um, a double um, setup there. And I can tell you a little bit about that because Angelica had, on Tuesday, Angelica had already asked Jack to run the memorial service, and he said yes. On Wednesday morning, he calls me up and says, Deke, he says, I, I don't want to do this. This is not my kind of thing. I don't know what to, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to do it. It's not, I, I don't do this kind of work. I said, Jack, I mean, I'm just brand new in town. We don't really know anybody, but what do you do? You defend yourself in some way. I mean, I have no idea. Say, Jack, he said, you told Angelica you'd do it. You're going to do it. What do you need? And he said, well, I'd like little little cards for bios on some of the people. I won't know everybody who's on the stage. Fine, Jack, I'll have that and send over to you this afternoon. So I write the cards for the people we know about so far, and I send them over to, by messenger. The th great thing about working with the Directors Guild is there are no budget questions. Nobody says, Mm, do I have to take a taxi or can I just use a messenger? You know, nobody, nobody, nobody even thinks about money at that level. You can do what you damn well please. And you get in return, the same thing. So on Thursday morning, he calls me a Jack. He says, Deke, he says, I'm, I can't do this. I'm not doing it. I said, 
I said, what do you need, Jack? He says, um, could you give me a few lines to introduce each people? Write some lines for me. I can write some lines for you. I'll send it over to you this afternoon. <laughs> so on Friday, I think I got two calls from him that he didn't want to do this. On Saturday, in the green room, before the thing is going to go on stage in the Directors Guild Theater over here, I'm sitting on a couch in the green room talking to Ray Milland, and Nicholson comes over to me, dragging behind him um, Jack Haley Jr. Now, Jack Haley Jr. is kind of Hollywood royalty. His father, of course, is in The Wizard of Oz, plays The Tin Man, plays in a hundred other movies. He's raised in the community. And a couple of years before that, I think it was around, I don't know, maybe even a decade before that, he had produced two films for MGM called That's Entertainment. Brilliant films of clips of, from MGM musicals. Really exciting films. They're really well done as, as clip shows. I haven't seen anything better to this day. So he's had the success. He may have even won, won an Academy Award for that. I don't know, because it was, it was really cel celebratory stuff. It was great stuff. Jack comes over to me and Saturday afternoon before the memorial service and says, Jack, he says, Deke, he says, Jack will do it. I don't, I don't want to do it. Jack will do it. Jack will do it. And Haley says to him, oh, yes, oh, yes. Oh, I'll do it. I can do it. I can do it. I can, I can absolutely do it. Don't, don't. I mean, Jack Haley... Really nice guy, made this brilliant film, had a wonderful family, and is just eager like a dog, you know, is a kind of a hanger on around Hollywood. He's always been a hanger around. That's, he's never really done anything, but. And I've got to sit there with my, Ray Moland listening to me over here and get Nicholson to actually go on stage and tell Jack Haley in the politest possible way so there are no re repercussions. No, I'm not going to. Thank you very much for your offer. You're very generous. I'm sure you can do it very well. But Jack has already agreed with Angelica. Now, I keep invoking Angelica in this thing because that's who Jack said hello to. I didn't know at that time. I only found out later that Jack and Angelica had a couple of years long affair. I mean, they were sleeping together for a couple of years. It was one of his big girlfriends, you know, and, which is a big privilege in Hollywood, evidently, because Jack Nicholson and Warren Beatty, big men around town, you know, with their celebrity and one the apparatus and one thing and another. So I tell Jack Haley Jr., thank you very much, but no thank you. and. Um, Nicholson, Nicholson is there. Now, there's a, a, a certain postscript to this story about Nicholson and the, 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 the John Huston um, uh, memorial went off very well. It was very nicely done. People liked him. The right people were chosen with Angelica and his secretary, Joan, you know, to get there. Nothing to do with me, but it all worked out and it worked smoothly. And to some extent, that was, it was per perfectly positive. I wanted it to work well, but uh, I had acquitted myself well enough in that, putting that whole thing together and making it work right, that nobody paid any more attention to me at the director's guild. He knows everything he needs to know. Look at what he's done. You know, I don't need to even think about him or support him anymore. And he goes, leave him alone. He does right work. Not really, but I got away with that one. It's after the memorial service now, and we're back in the green room outside the auditorium with the guys who had done the speaking. And I learned a couple of things there. In the first place, the green room now has 60 people in it, rather than the 15 or 18 that started out in there before, we, before the service. And I found out that there are some people, this is the true A list. There are some people, if they want to go through a doorway in Hollywood, nobody ever stops them. They can go anywhere they want to. So I'm looking around the room, and there's a lot of people that I don't know and had never dealt with because they're not in my memorial service, but they're all there. Okay, so that's the way Hollywood works. And I get a hold of Nicholson, and Nicholson and I walk out towards the center of the room a little bit, and we start talking about the first time that we met, which had been in Boston when I was a critic a long time ago. And he was traveling around the country with Bob Rafelson.
And Bob Rafelson had come to Boston to do publicity on five easy pieces or one or another of the films that they, he made. I don't remember. I don't remember which one. And Rafelson and I got into an interesting discussion. And we were talking and talking, and the other critics all left the hotel room that we were in. And we kept talking, we kept talking, and Rafelson says to me, this is really interesting, hold on a minute, Deke. He says, Jack Nicholson is upstairs, he's traveling with me because we're writing a script together and we're doing some work. Let me get him down here, because he'll be wondering what's going on. We'll continue, continue our talk. So he comes down, and we start talking. I get introduced to Nicholson, and Nicholson, seeing that I'm interested in film, starts promoting his film, the film on, it's a music film, you, you must know it, it's a Head. He starts promoting his film Head, which had come out the year before or six months before. Uh, a made up band, made up doing rock and roll stuff and one thing and another. And I had not, I had not particularly paid any attention to it. I had the poster, a nice poster very famous now, Mylar poster with silk screen on top, worth a fortune today. I don't have it anymore. But and we started talking and he starts telling me, I've really got to see the film because it's a really good film and the whole critics were all wrong about it. They wrote it up wrong, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we have this little discussion going on. Meanwhile, Nicholson and I are in the middle of the room and we start talking about we had met before the head and did he remember the discussion about it? And he did, actually, because we had a good argument and a good discussion about that film. He was very proud of that film and it just disappeared. And filmmakers who are really proud of something that disappears really want to talk about it. They really do. So we're in the middle of talking about this stuff in the middle of the green room at the Director's Guild and out of the corner of my eye I see Warren Beatty. Warren Beatty's coming towards us. Now, he wasn't a part of the ceremony at all, but he's one of the people that if he wants to go someplace after the show, he can go. Nobody will ever stop Warren Beatty from going. In. So he comes up, and I'm thinking, while I'm talking to, to Nicholson, I'm thinking, now, I'm going to find out how Hollywood really works, because Beatty's going to come over. He needs to talk to Nicholson. So he comes over, and I'll repeat the entire conversation, which, which mystified me at the time. Hi, Jack. Mm, hi, Warren. You drive? Yeah, drove. And Beatty walks on. And I'm stunned. I'm sitting there saying, what a piece of empty space. How, you know, what's that all about? Why bother? I mean, clearly Nicholson and Beatty have known each other for decades. You know, they've been around town, they've shared women, they've done this, they've done that, they've, you know, etc. What's that all about? And it wasn't until later that I realized that even in the green room of the Directors Guild, with limited access and still only a few people in there, all of whom are super professionals in the, in the field or administrators in, 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 the, in the movie business, if those two guys, those are the two most prominent people in the room, if they didn't speak and if they were, had not been seen to speak in a friendly way, the rumors would have started. Nicholson and they're having a spat. They're fighting. Are they working? Are they trying to fight over the same woman? Is what's going on? Who offended who? What's going on? It would get out of that room into the tabloid press, into the wider press, without question. I didn't realize that. It was necessary that Nicholson and Beatty just spent a few seconds together or had a few things to show that they were still friends and friendly and still getting along together, or else all kinds of scurrilous rumors would start. I didn't know that. And the other thing I didn't know was the lesser prominent of the two people is the one who would move towards and speak to the more prominent the person. So Beatty came to Nicholson, who was flying high at that time and working hard, Beatty was still between projects. He's always done fewer projects than, than Nicholson did anyway. So it had to be Beatty who went and acknowledged the fact that Nicholson was the... I mean, you think about these things. If you spend your life thinking about this kind of stuff, you never get any work done. You never do anything properly at all. But it's on these kinds of filigree, airy 
topics and subjects and materials that all gossip comes out of Hollywood and gets around on filmmaking. It's important to the people who are playing that game. Who does what and how? So it was a very significant moment. I learned something about that, even though I can repeat the conversation without fear of, you know, telling stories out of school or anything else. It's just, you know, was necessary. You were the National, National Special Project Officer for the Guild for two years. What did that involve, apart from what you just told us about, were you involved in any of the Oscar ceremonies? Mm, three years, um, and no, I didn't. Uh, I, I I went to the um, Oscar announcements one year, yeah, which is done at something like 5 a.m. Los Angeles time, so it makes the TV morning shows in New York City. And it was kind of fun to see. I never went to a ceremony. Um, people were talking about, a couple of people were talking about getting me to be a member of the Academy. And, didn't happen. Um, and I started out as the special projects officer in Los Angeles. The Guild has offices in Los Angeles and in New York, big ones, and a small one in Chicago because they got members in all cities. And of course, they have a lot of um, they have a lot of members in New York and a lot of television is in New York, and that's also Guild territory. So it turned out that. They had a special projects officer in New York also who was rather lazy, didn't really know history, didn't have much to do, you know, that nobody really liked or wanted around too much one thing or another. And so there was a, a time came when he was let go and I was made the national officer instead of the, just the special projects officer. I got promoted with extra responsibilities. And I hired a guy from Fordham, I think, University, if I remember correctly, to take uh, to be the staff person in New York, and he was there still when I when I left the guild. Um, it was an interesting job, um, and it had its ups and its downs. You turned out to be the funeral officer of the guild at one point. I ran an oral history pro project that was published by Scarecrow Press, uh, and, and for a few years, David Shepard and I were the co-series editors of that setup. It had been set up by David, and I just kind of got some of the work done to get some of the books actually published instead of just sitting around. We did a lot of courses for members, uh, only for members, because the Guild wanted to promote the idea that uh, an assistant director in television could become a director if he knew how to run three camera setups or other other categories of member could rise to the next because an assistant director in film, for instance, never sees a script, never sees the assistant, assistant director in, in, in film does all the practical work of getting the film set together and the crew together and getting the actors out of bed and making sure they're there and on time and in costume and et cetera, lots of things to do, but never would see a script and say, this would make a great film or not. So we ran script writing courses and script analysis courses, lots of different stuff. We, we ran, we ran um, courses for uh, directors, actually, preferably working directors, but it's a big membership on... Um, 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 camera work and lenses so that they could see what was going on. And it was really one of the great things about the Guild because I'd call up um, Arif, um, not Araflex, who's the uh, Panavision. I'd call up Panavision and say, can I get 20 cameras you know, in two weeks? And they'd say, yeah, fine. okay, maybe the week after, 20 cameras. They'd ship over like four million dollars worth of 35 millimeter cameras, and I'd call up Kodak and I say, "I need about 50,000 feet of film and, and processing for this seminar I'm going to give on Panavision and lenses." Oh yeah, okay, you know, use this account number, and they'd send me 50,000 feet of film, so get the cameras all loaded up and everything else, and then the next thing that would happen would be that. Um, 
um, um, um, um, um, you'd find the right cameraman who would actually lead the seminar for you, who knew the difference between a lens at this level and that level and what, what it meant and how it registered and how it looked and how it felt, you know, and what emotion you could wring out of it by changing the lens from here to there and back and forth. And you'd run sometime an all-day seminar on camera work, you know, for learning experiences for lenses, for, for, for members. Really technical stuff in many ways, but really important stuff. So that was a part of what Special Projects did also. And we did, we did a summertime, a week seminar on how to put a film together that was um, for university professors and teachers around the United States. And we'd bring in 12 or 14 people who had applied or wanted to do it, and we'd sit them down and we'd walk them through the entirety of a film production from seeing a first script to post-production, using experts in every one of those fields in seminars all the way through the through the day, which is really useful, a uh, really good setup, actually. But the, the Guild did a lot of interesting and good things, not just on its own behalf for its own PR, but on behalf of helping the rest of the community in film learn how to be more clear and accurate about what was going on in films. We did, every, we did everything. It was a hell of a job, really a hell of a job. You also programmed films at UCLA, I believe, for a couple of years. No, just for, for actually less than a year. That, that was an interesting, yes, an interesting story too. And I'm, I'm kind of proud of the story because Jeff Gilmore, was the uh, head of UCLA Film and Television Archives uh, exhibition department, that was their film programmer. And he was really good. He was a good guy. And we knew each other a little bit, and, and we knew each other pretty well, actually, and gone around. And Jeff was kind of headhunted by Sundance Institute to go out and run Sundance Institute, which he thought he might like to do it, and he had been programming for long enough. I certainly agreed with him about that. And he came back from Utah to Los Angeles County Airport, and he called me. Now, I was at that moment out of work because I had left the Directors Guild. And he called me up and he said, Deke, he said, I just flew in from Sundance and I'm on, I'm on my way to UCLA. I've got to tell Robert Rosen that Sundance has asked me to come out for a year on a trial to become head of Sundance. And he said, I know Rosen won't let me go unless I've got somebody that, to, to supply, I can supply him with somebody who will, who will take over UCLA programming. And I know Bob likes you. Will you do that for me for a year? Until I really decide whether or not I can do it. So uh, I said, yeah, I'll do that. Uh, I needed the work, but I also liked Bob Rosen, and I liked UCLA, and it was work that I knew. So I said yes to him, and he w w drove from the airport out to UCLA, told Rosen what was going on. Rosen agreed, and all of a sudden I was the uh, guest programmer guest head programmer at UCLA Film and Television Archive. And when I said to you a minute ago, I'm a little proud of that, I'm perfectly proud of that. You know, the film world is full of so many ambitious people and so many knowledgeable people and so many talented people at every level, in every different aspect of film. I was extremely pleased that Jeff Gilmore would ask me to do that because he knew at the end of the year I'd give him his job back. And I wouldn't have done a lot of things to undermine him and to find a way that uh, he'd be out and I'd be in. Which, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people in the business, whether they're academics or cultural people or whether they're filmmakers, would do. It's kind of standard operating procedure. I'm very proud of the fact that he asked me with that confidence that he'd get his job back. So I went over to UCLA uh, just for a year to take Jeff's place. And what happened there is that about halfway through the year, I got a call from Ken Vlaschen, who was also in Los Angeles and at, uh, at um, the American Film Institute, running the AFI Film Festival and other stuff. He had a hard life too, Ken. And he called me up and he said, um, 
Will you sit and talk to Leslie Hardcastle for a little while? If, if he came to L.A., he's looking for a new programmer for the National Film Theater. And I said, yeah, of course, Ken. I mean, I'll talk to anybody. There's no need to, you know, be shy about that. You see, Ken said, you pick the restaurant and I'll tell Leslie where to go. And I did. I got to pick one of my favorite little, re little restaurants. Quite nice, quite a Hollywood restaurant, but not one of the flashy ones. And um, I sat down with Leslie and we had lunch. And two days later, I was on a plane to, Los to London to interview for the job of film teacher. He had talked to three or four people, programmers in the US already. I knew a couple of the people he talked to, uh, but he decided he wanted to f put me on the spot, so I came out. So in the end, I told the BFI that I couldn't leave for another six months because um, I was committed to UCLA for that time. And that went around the corner a couple of times, and I finally talked to Bob Rosen and this and that, and I said, okay, I'll stay another three months in Los Angeles, and I'll come three months early to you. So I, I left UCLA before the end of my full year, but I prepped all the work I could do that would last through that year, through that programming cycle to the end of that year. And I came to London and well, before we three come months to early. London, I want to finish some loose ends, if I could. I believe that you were involved in two films in 1989 and 1991. One as technical advisor on a documentary on Jack Levine, and the other, um, the same, technical advisor on an artist called Carissa Kent with E. Mary Saint. What are your memories of these two? Uh, those are two things. The, the, um... The Jack Levine film was David's next, David Sutherland is his name, was David Sutherland's next film, and I, where I was brought in a little bit earlier and gave a little bit more advice and got another credit. He was very generous about that, and I was perfectly happy to do that because that's what you do. You, you know, you give advice and you give the best advice you know how to do, and that's a, that's a good film, interesting painter again. Um, the Korea Kent film was a slightly different um, because... Karita Kent was my first wife's teacher at Immaculate Heart College in Los Angeles, California. She was the head of the art department there and quite a famous artist under the name Sister Karita, in, under which name she appeared on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post magazine, on the cover of Newsweek magazine, etc., etc., etc. She left the uh, order that she was um, uh, with in 1966 and moved to Boston. And in Boston, um, um, she became Corita Kent instead of Sister Corita. She just became Corita Kent and continued making a lot of silkscreen prints and designs and materials. And more or less, I think it's fair to say, she was the movement artist of the 60s and 70s. Anybody who had a protest at the Pentagon, anybody who wanted to do a march against the war, you know, that went to Corita and she freely and happily made designs or logos or prints or whatever material. She also made her own prints and she sold them through a whole list of galleries around the country. Karita died in 1987, if I remember correctly. And I had promised myself and Mickey, my first wife, that I wouldn't leave town or nobody would leave town until after she died because she spent about half the year in California with her old friends there. And in that half year, I watered all the, her plants every day in her uh, back bay apartment. I had a key to her back bay apartment. And six months later, she'd come back and stay around for a while, and then she'd go away and this and that. And we were very close, the four, the four, the three of us, really quite, quite close and quite well known to, 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 to each other all the way around. After she died, um, and Mickey had the job of dividing up her estate and sending it out to her former pupils and friends and people all over the country without just collecting everything herself, and, but sending it out, and which she did, and she did right. 
there was talk in the air about making a film about her and her life. We knew more about this than anybody uh, then and now. And we were approached by a man by the name of Jeffrey Hayden, who was a um, filmmaker and television film director of longstanding since the 1950s, who wanted to make a film about her. And we all got together and decided we'd make this film together. And Jeffrey, of course, brought in his wife to the project, who was Eva Marie Saint. He married Eva Marie Saint in 1954 and stayed married to her until he died about eight years ago, nine years ago. Eva Marie is still alive as I speak. She'll be 99 in a few days. So we started this project and did this and we looked at materials. And we were the four of us were going to do it together. A year or so after that started, I got a job at the Director's Guild. And in my view, the last thing I was going to do was show up at that job in Los Angeles as a filmmaker. I had been a cultural film person, a film critic, and a historian, and a writer, and an academic, and a cultural figure for most of my career in one way or another. I wasn't going to end up telling people that I was meeting for the first time, oh yes, and I'm a filmmaker too, because I didn't think that was right, and I didn't think it was moral. So I dropped out of that project for the three of them. And my wife, Mickey, uh, back in Los Angeles, back in her hometown, she was born and raised there. Um, and Eva Marie and Jeffrey went ahead with doing what they needed to do to make the film. And we socialized a little bit together. Jeffrey is a former board member of the Directors Guild, very well respected in the community. So nothing wrong with hanging out a little bit or going here or there doing stuff. And we did stuff. Uh, we did wonderful stuff, actually. But I didn't participate in the film anymore. In the end, and I think it's after I left the Guild, the film was made and finished. Um, it's called Primary Colors, and it's directed by Jeffrey Hayden. It's about Corita. It's pretty good. It's okay. Another film on another artist, and I think I've got a credit in there somewhere. Uh, I was a part of that film at one point, but I didn't do any work on it in, in California. Can you tell me why you were called an expert witness at the pornography trial of War of Warhol's Chelsea Girls. Well, I, there is a, a reason for that. It's probably because I was called as an expert witness in the trial of the killing of Sister George a year before, and uh, they. Probably the same lawyer or another lawyer looking around to see who he, who he could get locally to actually speak on behalf of it. You had in Boston in, where are we, 1970 or 71, somewhere along in there, you had in Boston four major film critics, of which I was the minor one, the fourth. The other three film critics were the girls from Boston. Marjorie Adams was the first graduate of the um, um, School of Journalism at Columbia University, ever hired by the Boston Globe. It was still an undergraduate program when she took her degree in journalism. And she joined the Globe in 1917 and was still there as the film critic in the 60s and 70s. Alta Maloney at the Boston Herald was the daughter of the editor of one of the other Boston newspapers. There used to be seven or eight of them. There were now only three. And she got her job at somebody else's newspaper through her father as a film critic in something like 1951 or 52. And she was still there as a film critic at the Herald. Much put upon, but still there. Peggy Doyle, the critic at Hearst's newspaper, The Record American, was a little pixie of a girl, woman, uh, in her 60s for sure, who had been a leading crime reporter in Chicago at the Hearst newspaper in Chicago. And every day when she walked into the, to the um, uh, newsroom at the Hearst newspaper there, was a huge bouquet of flowers on her, on her uh, desk because she was the girlfriend 
in those young and flashy days, of a gangster by the name of Dini O'Banion, who, amongst other things, ordered the St. Valentine's Day massacre and ran a flower shop. He ran his gang out of the front of this little flower shop somewhere in the loop. So he sent over a bouquet of flowers to Peggy every day. And one day, she wrote up a story that she had clearly heard from her boyfriend that was the wrong story. It wasn't supposed to be public. She didn't realize that. When she went into the office, the flowers were still there. Her editor was in a panic. You've got to get out of town. You've got to get out of town today. That's it. We got it. I don't want you hurt. You're, you're leaving. Go pack. And he called around the Hearst newspapers. And the job that was open that she could take at the time was a film critic on the Hearst newspaper in Boston. So in 1934, 36, whatever it was, she gets shipped out to Boston to become the, the, the film critic. These women had never married, any of them, were all in long standing in place, were all quite elderly by then. And if you're a lawyer looking for a good expert witness, you weren't going to go to any film critic in Boston except me. Because you knew I was liberal and you knew I would speak and you knew I would, I had just done it the year before for the killing of Sister George. So that's how that happened. And unfortunately, you know, the question is blasphemy, you know, I mean, isn't, isn't the Chelsea girls blasphemous, asks the judge. And I, I didn't know any better. I quoted the law back at the judge, you know, U.S. 1951, Ohio versus whatever it was. I knew all the figures back in those days, which says that blasphemy is not pornography. You know, and that was a Supreme Court decision that it really kind of opened the floodgates for what could be shown and what couldn't be shown. And the judge looks down, and the lawyer is going, oh, no, you can't do that in the courtroom. You know, and the judge is going, it's not for the witness to inform the court, but for the, <laughs> you know, et cetera. I didn't know any better. I thought the law was the law, and I had the court, court citation right there. I knew a little bit about censorship. I was interested in censorship. And I thought, well, the law, if the law is the law, that's it. As we know today, no law can withstand the rhetoric of some flake who wants to kind of beat it into submission, which is why Trump isn't in jail. It's the only reason. So that's how I got into that's how I got into that one. You guys will know the killing of Sister George since it's a British film, and you be interested to hear why it came up on pornography charges in Boston. Now, Boston's blue stocking. It's got a long tradition of proper behavior and everything else. But what happened was, this is a, 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 a film about nurses. It's a film with a very slight lesbian theme about nurses. And some patron of the film in Boston, when it was being shown in Boston, went to the theater in which it was being shown took one look at it and thought it was a film about nuns because of the uniforms they wore. Didn't realize it was nurses, thought it was nuns. Therefore, slight lesbian theme, blasphemous, complaint, pornography trial. I can't, it was unbelievable how stupid these people can be. It happened in London as well. Yeah. Um, what was the TV pilot you made with Pauline Kale? Oh, that was fun. One of the TV stations in Boston wanted to see if they could do a series of stuff on films. They think maybe they could get some film stuff going. So they asked me over to, as host to run the, run the show or to be the, the talking head in the show. And they got Pauline Kale to come up from New York City because she had just published her book on Citizen Kane. And uh, Citizen Kane was therefore our topic, and we talked about Kane and what she had. She had big opinions about that film, um, um, as she as she wrote about it, weren't necessarily everybody's opinions. So, and we just did it as a as a as a um, uh, a pilot, and the station never picked up on it. Not my decision. I don't know why, but I have a. I used to have. I think that also got lost in, in, in the U.S. library. But I had a, a galley's copy of the Citizen Kane book that Pauline had signed for me, saying, Deke, our sweat has merged on camera. Pauline. 
<laughs> which is a usual kind of risque comment that she liked to make. It was a lovely book. Why were you invited in 1988 to be a delegate regarding the USSR information talks in Washington? That's interesting. Um, don't ask me why, but just for some reason, this is the uh, official plaque from that from that meeting. Right. Just to prove I didn't put it in the in the CV, you know, as as a line all by itself. And I keep my cup on it over here. But um, these were the first media talks between the Soviet Union and uh, the U.S. And they were very comprehensive talks. It was a big set of discussions, debates, exchanges, film, newspapers, publishers, television, a couple of other categories, because bureaucrats can always slip stuff up into categories in big ways. And I became a part of the film delegation. A little bit probably because nobody else wanted to do it, and somebody asked me, and I said yes. Or a little bit maybe because they wanted a rounded set of people. The other people in that delegation included a former president of United Artists Pictures. Jack Valenti, of course, ran the delegation. He was the head guy for all this dip diplomatic stuff that went around to, in Hollywood. And I knew him a little bit. And. Um, one other person, I can't remember who it was. But it was an interesting set of discussions because um, we got into the meeting, and there's the five of us from Hollywood, and Jack came in, may say, made a few words and talked to a few people, but then he disappears because he leaves the hard work to everybody else, as all these top, top leaders do. And the Soviet Union's delegation was about nine people, and they were on the opposite side of the table, and they started. And the Soviets always came to meetings of any kind really well prepared, in the sense that they were, they had a purpose, the purpose was clear, they had a goal that they needed to fulfill, and since they were an organized uh, set of materials, set of, of players, uh, they could kind of point as who went that always would fulfill those goals and go in that and go and move in that direction. So we get into the room, and the Americans were, as at other conferences that I was at, and with the Soviets and others, would kind of come and kind of talk off the top of their heads a little bit. They didn't really have a goal necessarily or anything else to do, to learn, and were more casual about things. So we sat down, and the Soviets started out with their proposal. They wanted to talk about their newest triumph in the film world which was that they were finally going to make their favorite uh, film uh, wished for for many, many, many years about Stalingrad. And they had just gotten a major filmmaker to sign up to make it for them, which was um, the guy who did all the uh, spaghetti westerns. The, the guy, Sergio Leone. Yeah, Ser Sergio Leone, thank you. So Sergio Leone had just signed on. He was going to make Stalingrad, the biggest budget film ever in the Soviet Union, and there's no one thing on And they went on and on and on, but they mentioned a few other projects, et cetera. And then they turned it over to us. And the first speaker for the Americans was the guy who had, uh, Gene Picker, his name was. And it was the former president of United Artists Pictures. And he just looked at the Soviets and said, uh, I do hope that you'll have a very good producer working with Sergio Leone, because you know, of course, that the man always runs desperately over budget. No film is ever finished until um, um, one of his producers steps in and takes over the production and finishes it, because he's incapable of finishing a project. And you know, that, and he went on and on and on about you know the, all the trials and tribulations agreeing 
that Leone was a brilliant director and a really top figure, and congratulations to you, but unless you can control him, you never get a completed film. And the Russians just sat there, the Soviets just sat there, astonished, you know, because one person on this kind of amorphous American team knew enough, because, but that's the kind of knowledge you have to have in Hollywood before you can work in Hollywood, because if you don't have that knowledge, you get screwed over and you get caught in all kinds of things you don't want to be in. I was in uh, Mike Medavoy's office one day before I went to Hollywood. Mike was, of course, the head of production at United Artists Pictures and left with his other five top executives to form Orion Pictures at, at one point when Transamerica wouldn't give them what they, what they needed, what they deserved. Mike took, I think it was five Academy Awards in a row for Best Picture. No other producer has ever done that. He was really brilliant when he was in his time. And the Museum of Fine Arts acquired him at one point as their Hollywood contact at the recommendation of a friend of mine named Kit Carson, who recommended him to me. And I recommended him to Kitty White. Kitty White wrote to him, and he became an advisor to our film program. It was through Mike Medavoy that the Museum of Fine Arts acquired after two or two and a half years of waiting. It took, takes a long time. And what you've got to do is be consistent. Kitty White was nothing if not consistent. We acquired from Mike the first ever public showing of a film called Amadeus. And the first time it had been outside the studio, well before it was in theatrical release anywhere, and we used that as a fundraiser to raise an endowment fund for the, for the museum. It's one of the proudest things that I've, I've really left behind me at the museum. It was a very large, because that screening of Amadeus, 380 people, absolutely filled, with Tom Hulsey and Carl, uh, what is his name, Saul Zantz and uh, Milos Forman and all the rest of them, everybody there followed by a dinner, in the, um, a dinner in the Impressionist galleries of the museum. Went on into the night, and all kinds of stories there. It was a lovely, lovely evening. We raised a couple hundred thousand dollars, which went as an endowment for the film program. That made sure that the film program would never close, that in some budget reorganization, it wouldn't kind of suddenly be uh, castrated in some way and not exist anymore. Now, and that's important because no museum will f fiddle with endowed funds because that's a sign, if they're willing to do that, that's a sign to every potential donor they have who wants to give money for a Asiatic art, who wants to give money for Impressionist gout, who wants to give something for uh, the 20 years down the road, they'll fiddle with their donation, it'll be used for something else. People who give money away don't like that, and so no museum will actually undertake that. So I'm in my, I go back, I'm, I'm in Mike Met Metavoy's office in Hollywood one day. I was I just out there, and I went over to see him and say hello and chat a little bit. And he, he, he took me into the office and closed the door and everything else and held off the phone the phones. And when we chatted a little bit about what was going on, what we could do at the museum, et cetera, et cetera, very nice. All of a sudden, the phone rings. It was a phone like people at green rooms couldn't be held back. He picks up the phone. He, it's clearly the producer of a film he's got in production who has just learned that Barbara Streisand is ready to do his film. And this producer is really excited because he thinks Barbara Streisand, you know, is the world's biggest star ever, blah, 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 blah. The, the, it's it's got to be about 1982 or 1981, something like that, somewhere along in there. Barbara Streisand. And Mike sits on the phone. I only hear one side of this conversation, but he's perfectly happy. He sits on one side of the conversation and tells the guy on the other end of the phone 
the, the role is not right for Streisand. Streisand won't do well with it. It won't help the film if she does that role. It's a, and doesn't he understand that her range is such and such, but not so and so, and doesn't work that way, etc. And a few minutes later, the phone call ends, and the guy's been said, go find another star. Streisand is not going to help you out that day. And, as I said a minute ago, that's the kind of knowledge you have to have to be able to work in Hollywood. Otherwise, you get caught in all kinds of dead-end situations or difficult situations that you don't want to be in in the first place. You have to know, like Gene Picker knew about Sergio Leone, what really lie behind the reputation and the, all the rest of it as to whether or not he could be worked with and how he needed to be worked with to get a good film out of him. Just like Mike knew from his producer that Barbara Streisand was not the right person to do that. Now, it takes somebody with a certain depth of knowledge, a certain spine, and a certain eloquence to be able to work through all of those materials to make it work. Um, and if you can't do that, you can't work in Hollywood. Not at a high level, you can. This is another sort of unusual question. What was your involvement with James Stewart regarding the Geneva Copyright Convention? Oh, that's a, one, that's a wonderful story. That's a wonderful story. When I went to the Directors Guild, they had a, uh, a campaign on to get the United States Congress to sign up to the Geneva uh, copyright convention. It's a much stronger copyright convention than the international copyright convention, which is the one the U.S. was mostly part of. In, in most all international situations, certainly in the 20th century, where countries got together to do something, the U.S almost never joined up with what the countries wanted to do, but founded their own very similar kind of congruous institution or organization, not quite the same, but close to the same, and led that organization instead of joining. So when copyright became a big issue in the early 20th century, the U.S. joined up with or founded, I don't know the history, uh, the International Copyright Con Convention, which isn't as strong or as clear as the Geneva one. They never signed at Geneva. Now, in the 1980s, the software companies and the music business wanted to join Geneva because it gave them better protections for their copyrights and better protections against piracy and exchange and one thing and another. And the film business was perfectly happy to join up with Geneva also, but they wanted to join all of, of Geneva because Geneva has an article in it called Article 6 Bis. And Article 6 Beast declares that the creator of a cultural work in copyright has rights to um, overrule any deformation or defacing of that creative work. You don't get economic rights. You don't get to own the property. But you can protect the property from being colorized, from being edited to fit some television slot, from, re you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, the, and that's where the really strong French law on copyright and the French law on showing complete versions on television comes from, is Article 6 piece. The American corporate sector got a federal judge somewhere, I don't know who, but it got a federal judge somewhere to issue an order, a declaration, that the United States could sign up to the Geneva Copyright Convention and get all its protections without implementing Article 6 piece. Separate. Not there. So the Directors Guild, over the next couple of years, spent five or six hundred thousand dollars to 
find a way of persuading Congress to reverse that thought about Article 6 piece, to try and declare that the article was not that dangerous to anybody who wanted to make money from their copyrights, that it wasn't imposed on anybody, but that we needed to do it. So that's how that happened. As a part of that campaign at one point, uh, the guy who ran it, who was um, the guy who made Cat Baloo, um, the director of Cat Baloo, I forget his name, I'll think of it in a minute. Uh, Elliot Silverstein. Elliot Silverstein ran, was running that campaign, had the idea, what would happen if Mr. Smith actually went to Washington? And would Jimmy Stewart support our part of it? Because they knew each other and they, they, he was known around as somebody who was proper and would probably support us. So somebody called Stewart and Stewart said, you know, um, yeah, I'll be happy to go. Yeah, I'll be happy to go to Washington. You know, it's just an unmistakable voice and drawl at the same time. So in the end, he flew to Washington. Do you have any idea how fast a United States senator, these are unapproachable people to every, you, you try and calling a United States senator someday, how fast when you say, Jimmy Stewart is coming next week. Do you have an hour to spend with him? He wants to talk to you about copyright. Every single senator had an hour that they could spend with Jimmy Stewart instantly because every single one of them wanted a picture of them with Jimmy Stewart in his Mr. Smith Goes to Washington profile on their office wall. It means honesty, it means integrity, it means, you know, popularity, it means non-elitist. Every single one of them, mm. they all fell right away for going to me. And we could, have, we could have sent George Lucas, we could have sent, you know, Steven Spielberg, we could have, you know, anybody. They wouldn't have cared. You would have argued with them. Jimmy Stewart, 100% was going on. In 1977, you interviewed Yvonne Rainier, the filmmaker. Yes. What are your memories of that? Oh, that was a kind of a funny, uh, kind of a funny thing. I liked Yvonne. Um, I've got a DVD of that interview around here somewhere. I don't remember exactly. It's, it's on one of these shelves. Um, there was a guy in Boston named Robert Gardner, and Robert Gardner owned most of the CBS affiliate in, in Boston, uh, Channel 5. And because he owned most of it, he decided to set, set up a little um, show, late night weekend show, on avant-garde cinema, avant-garde film. We all knew this, we all watched it. Everybody who came to town got a slot on his show. And at one point, this turned out to be Yvonne Rayner, whose film I had just shown a couple of days before at the Museum of Fine Arts. And um, I liked the film, and I liked her. I thought her film was quite Godardian, uh, in fact, in the kind of classic Godard period. And Bob watched the film and hated it. He just didn't like the film. And I knew that, and he was there at the screening, and I talked with him afterwards a little bit. He just didn't like it. He called me up the next day saying, Yvonne's gonna come over two more days to the studio and talk about her film. Would you appear with her? Because I don't like the film, at least you liked it, and you argued with me about it, and you know, you can say some good things about it, how about that? And I said, sure, you know, and that's what you do. So that's how I got into that uh, thing with Yvonne Rayner. And the, the DVD is kind of funny because at one point I talk about Godard and her and what's going on with the film and how it's, and she looked at me, how did you know that? How did you learn? Because that's exactly what she was thinking of. And it was just because I was in, in, immersed in all of this stuff myself at the same time and I saw it, you know, no, no big deal. And we had a kind of a bit of fun. I never heard anything more about it. Um, about 
10 years ago, maybe 12, this DVD suddenly appeared in the mailbox because Bob had decided to take that particular program and put it out as a longer-term project or something or other, and he, and he sent me a copy, which was very nice of him. Um, as far as I know, he still doesn't like the film. He was, a, he was a really interesting guy. He was also very much involved in the Carpenter Center for the Arts at Harvard and told me once, because I went to him once and asked him for some money or asked him about the potential for some money. And he said, no, I said, I'm, I'm tied up right now. He says, I'm not really as rich as, as, as people think. It's Gardner's an old family, an old family name in Boston. He said, I can give away maybe $5 million every five years, but you're in the middle of stuff. I, it'll be another couple of years before I have that kind of money again. You know, it, it takes that long to accumulate. Only five million dollars every five years. Okay, rich enough for me, you know. But he didn't give me any money. He was a filmmaker also, Bob Gardner. A, a documentary filmmaker of ethnographic films and quite well respected, indeed. Yanomama people. In particular. You also curated an exhibition about Boston's Irish. Whoa. Why was that? <laughs> well, oh, that's another strange story. Um, Boston Museum opened a major traveling show around the United States, went to two or three other uh, museums, of the treasures of early Irish art. The main treasure, of course, was the Book of Kells, which traveled to the United States for these museum exhibitions. I think it was the first time it was ever out of, out of Ireland. And I think it's the only time, actually, that it's ever traveled. So we opened it with the Book of Kells and other Celtic pieces and Celtic gold and one thing. It was quite a good exhibition. I was working at the museum at that time. I was in the education department, and there was... My boss at that time was a complete loser, just a complete loser. It happens, you know, you get stuck with a boss. The job is good, you know the people, you know what's going on, but the boss is just impossible. And it turns out in the approach of this show that the second main exhibition gallery, the show was going to take up the big special exhibition gallery and its right-hand wing. The left-hand wing, which is a pretty big gallery, was going to be contextualization of the Irish art and Irish materials with funding through a grant that my boss was going to write and then was going to organize the thing in one thing or another. It turned out about six weeks before the Book of Kells arrived and the show opened, six weeks, seven weeks maybe, that my boss had done nothing. She hadn't written the grant, she hadn't gotten the grant, and the room was empty. I didn't like her very much. I didn't think she was very good. I was right, clearly. And I was sitting in the office of the museum designer at one point, the guy who installed shows and put stuff together, the museum designer, good friend. And I said, Why don't you, you should do a show on Boston's Irish in there. Just, it's, it's easy enough to do. It's a good subject to attract people. And he says, oh, go tell, go tell the assistant director about that. Tell him right away. I said, I'm not telling him right away. It's not my job to do that. I could be less. Not, no way. I didn't circulate in those areas of the museum. That's the stratosphere, you know? And... Maybe the next day, the associate director comes down to my office in the basement, semi-unique opportunity, he says, I hear you're talking about doing a show for Boston's Irish in the show, Irish show. Come upstairs, I want to talk to you about that. So somebody, one of my friends, so-called, in the design department who did circulate in that room, in that world, said, why don't you do this? And they thought about it upstairs and they decided to do it. So I got the commission to fill the other side of the Special Exhibition Gallery in six weeks. Now, the thing you've got to know about that, and which I did know in part, was 
that Kevin White, who was mayor of Boston 15 years before this, had set up a whole task force to look at ethnic Boston and do exhibitions and shows and support services and cultural events around Irish, Italian, black, other ethnic groups, Hispanic in Boston. They had gone around and couldn't do an Irish show because the, nobody had ever saved anything. Museums, libraries, and associations in Boston have saved every matchstick that Henry David Thoreau ever lit a cigar with. You talk about Thoreau, you talk about Emerson, they've got everything, manuscripts, etc. The Irish community in Boston, they have nothing, zero. And I kind of knew that, which is kind of why I backed off that idea. But I also knew that the woman who had done the uh, ethnic stuff around Boston, I called her the first thing and said, what did you find? And they gave me a list of maybe three objects. There are three things that related to Boston's Irish community that I could get from other museums, three. And the guys upstairs wanted me to find enough to fill that room. So I went around, I looked at stuff, and I, I, I lucked out with two, with two uh, options. I called everybody I could think of. In the first place, an anonymous local historical society in Dorchester, in the neighborhood of Boston, where I later bought a house, actually, Anonymous had a bunch of material that was really good material just in their own hands, never institutionalized, but good material. S pictures of storefronts saying, no Irish need apply. You know, yeah. one, of the, one of the famous things in Boston, but find the picture because nobody has kept the picture. These guys had that and, and a few other things of interest in the Irish community. The second thing I lucked out was that I got a hold of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library. Now, the library was still being built, and all of the stuff that was going to go into that library was in a storage vault. It was not open, it was not seen, it was not public. But the guy at, uh, who was director of the library and watching its, watching its building and then would install the show, was a really lovely guy, very intellectual, very good guy, and we quickly got on the same wavelength, and he said, I quote, well, I'd better take you over to the vault, hadn't I? So I go into the vault with him, because he's the only guy who's got access to this non-public material, all of which had been given to President Kennedy. Now, I know anything that was given to President Kennedy in Boston is going to create a crowd. This is absolutely what you need to have for Boston's Irish community. This is the pinnacle of the Irish community. This was the president. This was the assassinated president. There you go. So we go through this stuff. And he shows me some stuff, and I look at some stuff, and we go through. And he gives me about 110 objects along with the three pieces I could get from other museums or from the Boston Public Library, and the half a dozen things I got from the Dorchester Historical Society, and a couple things I found in other places just by scraping the floor as hard as I could and getting it all together, I got a show together and I, I did a show in six weeks. It was open the same day that the rest of the show was opened. It's just one of the things you just one of the things you do, you know. I'm 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 not really the, the most creative or the most advanced uh, person in the world at all, but I tell you, I'm very good at doing the jobs I'm asked to do, and I was very good at all those jobs. And when I decided to go into writing about early cinema, I think I'm pretty good at early cinema work too. We haven't come to that yet. We will in a minute if we've got yeah. time. My final question to the, before leaving the United States is a link with Britain, and that, that is that you knew Roger Mandel at Boston University. Oh, yes. What was he like? Because he wrote the first book with Rachel Lowe. Roger, Man Roger, Roger Mandel was really quite an impressive person. I saw his CV once. It's longer than mine. He wrote like 25 plays of the week and you know, did all kinds of stuff Roger did. Um, 
Tony Hodgkinson in, 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 uh, introduced me to Roger Manville, knowing he needed a tutor, or wanted a tutor, because he was way beyond you know correcting student papers. He just didn't do that at all anymore. So we we met. We had dinner. Tony thought I would be a good guy for him, and he agreed. And I think he was paying me out of his own pocket because I don't, Boston University didn't didn't have a tutor system. They didn't provide tutors. He was a university professor long after his retirement. Here, it's because he married a new wife, right? You know what his Roger and his wife. Roger's wife was an esteemed member of the British Film Institute staff and was around the staff, much beloved. And Roger took off after some French woman that he met somewhere and fell in love with a French woman and divorced the wife and married the French girl. Made him persona non grata with the staff of the British Film Institute. They didn't like that at all. They didn't want to hear about that. And they, Francoise, her name was, and they didn't want to have anything to do with her. So that, that's when he left town and went to Hong Kong and did stuff in Hong Kong. And then he went to the States, got an appointment there. He must have been 70 or 75 when he took up that appointment at Boston University. And when I met him, because uh, I wasn't traveling to England or anything, I didn't know him there. But he hired me to be his tutor. And he was a real cut and paste man, dry, dull lecturer in the most staid and reserved way, which is just not how a lot of American academics act. I mean, he was really quite out of, out of phase with a lot of academics. He knew his stuff, but he never dealt with anything personally. You never had a sense of his personal involvement or excitement or in work with him. So, and what I did in the end, we, we had dinner every once in a while. We got together with Tony and his wife Phyllis every once in a while. Um, things went along fine, but mostly what I did was collect papers from him, write them, hand them back, and, and not much, much else than that. Although I do think there are not too many academics or too many historians in their own career, short career, even half career, can say they were, you know, really in touch with Kitty White at the museum, from the Museum of Modern Art, Jim Card at Eastman House, David Shepard from everywhere else, Roger Manville. You know, there's a certain, there's a certain uh, imprimatur that, that comes with all of that. You add all that stuff up, you know, and I've been very privileged to live in that world a little bit. Um, like us having John Gillett. I never, well, yeah, exactly. And I worked with John Gillett because John Gillett was banished from the F from the BFI because Wil Wilf couldn't stand him and wanted to get rid of him, but couldn't. So he sent him to the NFT. He was actually working out of my office for the last couple of years that he, he was there. Sight and Sound didn't want him. Sight and Sound had that new editor who was going to revolutionize the world. And all he did was boost himself up so that he became director of the ICA. And then after that, he got in a fight at the ICA and went someplace else and did something else for himself, leaving rubble in his, in his, in his wake, including Sight and Sound, where he kicked out John Gillett, and including the ICA, you know, which had to be practically rebuilt from dust after he got finished with it. He was such a jerk. That, I don't remember that guy's name. I've certainly blocked it. But he and I were supposed to be the two new breaths of fresh air at the British Film Institute. We were the two younger, from outside, ordered in. And we were pushed together by Wolf Stevenson and other executives at the BFI in the sense that we were supposed to be the friends and collaborate with all these new projects and inviting things. We had one meeting together. I hated this guy on site. I said, he's out for himself. He's not out for the good of film or television or anything else at all. You'll never get anything out of him unless it's for him. And, you know, from time to time we were in a meeting, but it never warmed up because it was, the guy was a complete jerk. When you were programming, how far ahead did you have to program? Was it like three years, four years, five years? Or were you aiming for centenary right from the beginning? For programming, 
I inherited a difficult position in programming because Sheila Whitaker, my predecessor, had been forced out of the job of the NFT. She didn't want to leave the job. She didn't want to change jobs at all. And, and she was literally pushed out by Leslie Hardcastle, by Wilf, by whatever combination of forces does that in institutions like that. So when I walked into my office for the first day and met my staff, met all the staff were working at stuff at the first, or maybe the first day or maybe the second day after I knew who everybody was and I sat down and just looked at stuff on my desk and I was doing instant message one thing or another, somebody brought me a box. And it was a, a letter box, a kind of a file box that you, you get like these down here. This thick had a stack of letters in it. It was all the letters about programs and all the offers of programs and all the suggestions that had come in to Sheila Whitaker for the previous six months since she had been forced out and I was hired, but not yet in place. And I was, and I was told, you can answer these now. She had saved up a whole six months worth of stuff that she didn't deal with at all that I had to deal with. And some of those letters were important. Some of them were just courtesy. Some of them needed to be answered. Some of them didn't, but were. Mum was for me, probably. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't remember. I didn't pay. I didn't pay that much attention. I. I did. I did get a call from Wilf Stevenson at one point about a week later saying, why haven't you answered Sir so-and-so, so-and-so, who was one of the suggestions because his wife's cousin was a movie star in the 1930s who I had never heard of before and he wanted a season, you know. I mean, so it, people did leak out of that box. But, so. but I was at some, something of a disadvantage here when I, when I showed up um, because... The NFT was one of the world's great cinematechs, in my view, and had three theaters, at least, sometimes a fourth, but three theaters. It was running, give or take, a hundred films. It was running a thousand films a month, give or take, sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more for one reason or another. And if we're looking today at June the 12th or 13th, whatever it is today, we'd be in the middle of the June book, the middle of a thousand films. I would be cleaning up May because I'd still be sending films back to wherever they belonged or getting bills out and fussing with stuff from May. And a couple of things would be left over from April because there's always a couple of problems somewhere. You don't know where to send the film. You don't know what to do. You know, some bill that never got paid for inexplicable reasons. Okay, fine. So that's June, May, a little bit of April. In today in June, in the middle of June, the book, the 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 um, um, the. Um, booklet for July would be coming out like tomorrow or the next day, it would come out sometime this week, which would open up the book. So July was completely done. The August booklet would be going to print in about a week, somewhere along, or maybe two weeks, it'd go a little bit there. You'd be cleaning up the problems in that, but all the other planning. You'd have a few ideas for September and October where you knew you could be doing stuff, and maybe something for advance. To program a season a year in advance, or a half a year in advance from today, was a luxury that we didn't have enough staff or enough facility, or I didn't have enough brain power to actually do. Once in a while, maybe you got a good idea that could go next January or something, and you kind of held on to it, and you started people working on it or started rolling towards it a little bit. But essentially, today, I'd have 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 
maybe 50, 55, or 6,000 on my plate that I was dealing with, that I still had to ar arrange copyright or prints from or shipping of or something or other else. When I came to the, I mean, Africa is one of the most difficult places to do a season. And it, it was a season I always wanted to do, but Sheila did this season at the, at the National Film Theater two years before I got here. It was a brilliant season. She did it well. I know how difficult that was. And it was incredible. So I arrive on January the 1st, 1991. She has done this season, I think, in 1989. As I started accumulating stuff around the office and figure out where I was, there were still a dozen African films sitting in storage downstairs that nobody knew where to get the filmmaker and where to get the prints back to. When I left three years later, as far as I'm concerned, most of them were still there because we still hadn't found solutions to that. So there's all kinds of stuff that happens in, in the middle of this kind of machine. And programming something a year, a half a year in advance really can't be done unless you do the easy stuff and the opportunistic stuff, which doesn't give you good stuff to show in a, in a cinematic. It's not easy and it's really a mess. And when your predecessor doesn't want to leave and wants to screw you up and wants to go through, you know, that doesn't help either because the, there's no advice going on there. What about the film festival each year? Were you involved in that as no, well? Not at all. That's what she did. She held on to. And um, the theory was I was going to take over the film festival at some point, but she was never going to give it up and people stopped being careless about her. And in fact, I have to say this. I mean, it's really true. She, she got blamed for a lot of things that were not her problem. Um, and people took after her for reasons. That, and I think some of them took after me for reasons that wasn't my problem either. Every programmer is different. I got asked a hundred times, what did I think of Sheila's programming? I never said an opinion about it. I said programmers are different and everybody has a different way of putting the history of film and the creative work of film together. You can't, you can't judge one person against another and I'm not, never going to judge her work. In the end, by the time I left, Sheila and I had become, a, uh, I think, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right about this, a certain kind of friendship because she realized that I was a programmer and I was going to defend the theater against all intruders, even if I didn't have her programs, you know, uh, the same as hers. And we were in lots of meetings together, in one of which she came to me after the meeting. It was a really tense meeting, let me tell you. And she came and she said, Deke, she said, I thought Wolf was going to take a fist and hit you at one point in that meeting. I said, well, you know, he can try, you know. And she, that was her opinion of what was going on in that meeting. I didn't see it quite that way, but Wolf was extremely insistent and I was extremely stubborn because it was something he didn't need to know about. And I wasn't going to tell him. That was the old Jürgen Berger story going on. But so she really came, I think, we, I think if we had worked there a little bit longer, she would have realized that I wasn't after her and I didn't throw her out and I didn't go after her mm -hmm. but that I would, and I didn't have her kind of programming, but I was going to defend the theatre at all costs. What, what about Brian Coe and Stephen Herbert at MoMI preparing for the centenary of cinema? Were you involved in that in any way? No, I'm not involved in that at all. And uh, Brian Coe had a programming slot in the NFT, so I dealt with Brian every month because he had to come up with a little program and a couple of films and one thing every month. And I am very sorry to say that I didn't appreciate exactly what Brian was up to because Brian was always late. Uh, he never made a deadline. You always had to call him two or three times over a period of 10 days after his deadline to actually get 60 words or 110 words out of him or get him to decide what it was he was going to do. 
And as much as I appreciated his knowledge and his background and his material, I really didn't like working with him. And I'm sure that showed in our relationship somewhere along the way. Um, he was much more engaged with Momi, but nothing to do with me. And I just couldn't get him to hand in stuff when he was supposed to hand in stuff, sadly. In 1991, you published a monograph on the press with Philip French. What was that about? That's an interesting story, and I can tell you a little bit about that, because... Um, uh, damn it. That monograph. Oh. Is that what it is, right? That's it. Right. British Film Institute and The Observer. Um, this is dossier number... I don't have that. I can't tell from the... You don't have that? No, I don't. That's why I asked the question. I didn't know it. Dossier number six. Right. So before that came out, there were five NFT dossiers. And the, the NFT, every once in a while, for one programmatic reason or another, published a dossier to go with the season. This was with a season of newspaper films or to go with something else. In this particular case, Philip came to me and said that the Observer is going to have its 50th anniversary. Why don't we do something for that? We'll do the newspaper season. And he liked newspaper films. He knew I liked newspaper films. It was easy as pie rolling off the, rolling off, off the, off the um, thing. So I did any number of those things because I did one for New Chinese Cinema with the uh, cinema I knew you did operation. One. Ian Christie did one for uh, Protazanov. Right. I think I've got that one with Ian Christie, yeah. And there, there are two or three others. And you did one on 40 years of the NFT. Yeah, that was a little history I did. I just wrote that history one weekend because the NFT was going to get its 40th, um, 40th birthday which we celebrated, but nobody wanted to celebrate it because they wanted me out of there and they didn't want to celebrate anything. Very nice. I got that. That was printed by the booklet printer. Uh, so that's a kind of a mini booklet. And he printed it for us for free because he knew he had been overcharging us forever uh, with the booklet. But you missed Hollywood and drugs. I don't have that. Oh. That came out after I, I set that up, but it oh. came out after I, after I was in. Yeah. Now, I want to talk about the NFT. Uh, um, dossiers for a minute because I think it was an important an important part of what we did. We did them with a because we did a season or whatever was going on. And every time I did one, right pretty much after the first one, the press, I'd get a call from Will Stevenson, who would say, "Why didn't you go through BFI Publishing?" BFI Publishing just complained. You're publishing down there. They don't know anything about this stuff. You have ISBN numbers. You have all the rest of it's going on. But that should be, we've got a publishing department. And I would say, yeah, but they're slow and they don't really do things right. And you, you give it to them. They take control and they do it a different way. We're doing just stuff that's extra documentation for the season one. But I'd have to kind of make this explanation pretty much every time I published the dossier, and it probably kept me from publishing a couple of them. It really slowed me down a little bit. Until one day, I got a call from Will, and he said, Richard Attenborough is leaving the board. Do you think, it was very cautious about this and very nice, because he knew I bristled at wrong suggestions. Do you think you would have a room somewhere to do a season of some of his films as a kind of a tribute because he's leaving the board? He's been with the board for a number of years. And I said, yes, of course, Will. He called me at the right time, and I had ruined the next schedule. So I penciled in advanced planning, penciled in a Richard Attenborough series and one thing or another, and I didn't think anything more about it. Four or five weeks later, as that season approached, I got another call from the director. He is the director, after all, competent or incompetent, you've got to deal with him. 
And he said, Deke, he said, um, Richard Attenborough, Richard Attenborough's season is coming up. He says, um, do you think you could do a dossier on Richard, on Richard Attenborough? I said, well, I probably could, Wilf. That's, this was news to me, a big surprise. Probably, he says, David Robinson will write it. He's already agreed to do that. And Richard's already agreed to open his entire archive of photographs and papers and everything else to, to um, David. He said, it'll all be done for you, and I'll pay for it. I said, in that case, Wilf, when do you want it? He said, well, we need it in about five weeks when the, when the season opens. I said, fine with me. It'll be on your desk in five weeks. Because I knew how to do things fast, and I knew how to do all this stuff was done. I'm too busy to sit around thinking about press, you know, when I'm running seasons and I've got a thousand films to do and I've got problems to deal with there. You either do this zip, zip fast or forget it, you know. It's, you call on your journalism background, your history. You call on Philip French, who's got good ideas and really knows his stuff and can also write fast if he needs to. So, Wolf calls. And I do a Richard Attenborough dossier by, written by David Robinson. And that was the last word that I heard about why are you doing dossiers and why, are, why don't you go through bitter publishing? I asked Phil in that same phone call, I said, I can do that if you like, Wilf. I said, why don't you go to British Publishing? Oh, I, w I went to publishing, but publishing says they'll take a year and they can't do it any faster. And they said, well, I knew that. That's why I'm doing my dossiers that go with my seasons. Mm. I'm not waiting around for those guys. And I'm not planning those seasons because I don't have time to deal with that two years in advance or three years in advance so they can get integrated into it. It doesn't work that way. Films come in and out of circulation. You can't get the films anymore if you wait that long. Sometimes, sometimes it's not. It's two different ways of doing that. Well, well, obviously, leaving the NFT in the abrupt way you did, you sort of changed tack and started another career, in particularly to do with early cinema. Um, and I think you went pretty quickly over to Utrecht um, and gave a talk on Dutch cinema. Uh, what would you interest in that? Uh, that's a uh, that's that's a, a, a complete sidebar. What what happened was I didn't leave the uh, NFT abruptly or anything else. What they did was they hired and they got rid of Jürgen Berger, who was completely incompetent and really shouldn't. He was head of the South Bank. They weren't going to put Leslie Hardcastle back as head of the South Bank because they didn't like him either. I mean, Wolf hated him, and so did most of the people up in Stephen Street. Um, so they hired a new guy to take uh, um, uh, Jürgen Berger's place as head of the South Bank, and he was a funny guy, um, semi-knowledgeable, semi-careerist, semi-out for himself, but the only thing he knew was programming. And because he had been a regional film programmer out in Manchester or Birmingham or someplace like that, I don't know exactly where. But he came in, he calls me in the office, he reviews the whole program that I'm in the middle of putting together and sorting out and planning. And what with one thing and another, he decided that the only thing he knew anything about, he didn't know anything about museums or running facilities or, fest, but he knew programming, so he'd let me go at the end of my contract. So I was informed that my contract would not be renewed. I would have had my three years, three full years as contract, and thank you very much. So that's how I left. And all planned, nothing sudden, sudden about it, really, kind of. So when I left the NFT, which would have been in 94, I did decide, I did decide that um, I had been doing stuff that other people asked me to do for a long time. I was asked to come and take a program at the, at the, at the Museum of Fine Arts, and then asked to go to Hollywood, and then asked to go to one thing. And I was all, uh, as a generalist, I knew a little bit a little bit about all kinds of cinema, old, new, world cinema, you name it, a little bit. Or I knew at least 
how to find the person who knew more and work with them to get things done. And I decided when I left the NFT that I would do what I was interested in instead of doing what other people were interested in. So I sat down and started working on early cinema because I've been interested in the beginnings of cinema and the, and the, the origins of it all my life. And some of those books up there, which are some of the oldest ones, are books that I bought in used bookstores in the 1960s when they were still available and nobody wanted them. And others were brand new in the 1960s, and I bought them, and hardly anybody else wanted them. So I had a good library, and I had an interest. That interest had been there forever. And I just wanted to do what I was interested in instead of what other people thought I should be doing. And, so I, and that's how I got back into early cinema. The, the two things happened to me. First, I made the first chronology. And that first chronology was based on one I had done for the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences when I was in Hollywood and working at the, at the DGA. Uh, the Academy had a brilliant idea about the centenary and advanced planning, let me tell you, advanced planning. They tried to get, they, they did, they got together all the different arts groups in Los Angeles, big ones and little ones. Little ones could work a little faster, big ones like Symphony Hall, downtown, big theaters, uh, institutions at, at um, uh, UCLA and USC, all kinds of institutions, and brought them together to see what everybody could do for a centenary. Could we have music concerts related to that? Could we have theater plays related to that? Could we have other things related to anything else? And after the first meeting, that I, and I was there, and everybody else was there too, because when the Doug Edwards was their special projects officer and a brilliant character, really good guy. He knew how to ask people to do things. And when the Academy calls you up and says, come to a meeting and let's think about the centenary that's like five years out, six years out, you've got plenty of planning time to do that and everybody goes. The problem for Doug was at that first meeting, Nobody knew enough about the history of the cinema to know what kinds of dates or events they could hang events on for the centenary. They just didn't know the background. It wasn't there. It wasn't anywhere in print, it, it, in English, it, nothing. So I promised Doug, I said this in the open meeting, that I would make a little chronology to give everybody an idea of what the major events were and when the kinetoscope came out, et cetera. And that became... That, and that, I did that for the next meeting a couple of months later. I did that, I wrote it all up, and that was circulated to the, everybody in Los Angeles involved in the Academy's centenary program. And when I left the NFT a couple of years later, I decided to kind of polish up that, that um, chronology and do it properly, do it right, do it full scale. But you'll remember that the first chronology, the special issue of, um, of uh, film history, starts in 1989. It starts in 1889. starts in 1889 and goes to the end of 1896. That was the end of centenary. But it starts in 1889 because that would be 100 years for the smallest groups, the fastest groups to schedule something and plan something that they could come into this uh, umbrella for the uh, academy. And I never thought about it again. I just sat down. I was working hard. I just sat down and started putting a lot, of, a lot of stuff together for the next chronology. Now, it's got a very awkward starting point, 1889. It doesn't, it's a date that doesn't mean anything. It's not the date of the kinetoscope. It's not the date of anything else. But it was the date I started with because that was the first programming date we had at the academy. Two, take one. Deacon, 1998, you published Living Pictures on the origins of cinema. Can you tell me something about that, please? Well, that's an interesting story. A couple of people have asked me uh, since that book came out, 
a couple of people have asked me, you know, how did I get a publisher to take a book on early cinema and the origins of cinema? Because it's, you know, nobody wants books on that topic and one thing and another. And I've really never answered them honestly because it was really a strange circumstance. Uh, while I was working on stuff like the original chronology and some other articles on early cinema and whatever that I was interested in and starting to do things for myself, I got a call from a guy in Montana who I actually didn't know very well. I had met him like twice and knew him just barely. I knew some of his work because he wrote a lot about different kinds of films, different places, modern films, etc. So I knew who he was. And he called me up and he said, Deke, he says, I'm the new series editor for a book of film books from the State University of New York Press. What are you working on? We'll take a book from you, anything you want. And I said, well, you know, I'll think about that a little bit and see what, what's going on. I haven't really considered writing a book yet. Um, let me get back to you. So I thought about it for a while, not interesting offer. And I thought, well, maybe I'll do a book on Louis Mal. I like Louis Mal's films, and I like filmmakers who do both narrative features and documentaries. And Louis done a lot of do a lot of documentaries. And I thought maybe Martin Scorsese could. I like his films too. And then I thought somebody else, maybe one of the guys in the '30s that worked in four or five countries and has always gotten short shrift because he isn't really a part of any national industry. Cavalcanti has really never been covered the way he should be. Duvivier has never been covered the way he should be. I thought about it a little bit. And in the end, I said, no, I'm interested in early cinema. That's what I'm doing now. I'll write a book on the origins of cinema. I'll write the first, first book on the chapter. And I looked around. There is no literature. There were no books in English on early cinema and the beginnings of the cinema since 1950, when an American guy published a, published a book. It's back here somewhere. So I called him up and I said, this is what I want to do. I will do anything. And the guy said, oh, great. We'll take it. He says, write to this, this guy at the State University of Press in Albany. Tell him, tell him you've got five chapters finished. You'll finish the next three chapters in the next three months and you'll you know, be, be ready to go. Said, okay. So I write a letter in our email to this guy in Albany, New York, at the press, saying, I've got five chapters finished. Now here's the outline, the five, seven chapters, eight chapters it's going to be, and I'll finish the others in the next three months. He writes back to me, he says, we'll give you our preferred contract. Oh, really? Good. That means no money either, but then complete, completely naive response. But he took the book, he sent me a contract, and so over the next three months, I wrote Living Pictures, The Origin of the Cinema, totally from beginning to end, complete. I had written not one word when I got the, when I got the contract. So I did that and that's how it got published because it was taken on. What's interesting about that book is that besides being the first book since 1950 or 1954 in English covering that period of pre-cinema and early cinema, is that it was given an American Library Association Choice Award, which is the imprimatur that the American Library Association gives to the best academic books of the year. So any librarian any around the United States doesn't have to be an expert in that subject to say that this is an outstanding book that they should buy. They can buy it just off that, which they do. And they, it's sold everywhere because, because of that imprimatur. And it's a really interesting... Uh, tick, to have box to have ticked uh, as it goes on. And from then on, I just kept writing on what I was interested in doing and what was going on and published a couple more books. And, you know, I've got another one waiting for a press to say yes. I've gone the official route this time and uh, I'm waiting for a press to, to conclude its deliberations. They've got two uh, readers reports in, both of which are very positive, say they should publish this book. They're waiting for the third. It's been five months and they can't get the third one out of their third guy. Um, but they've now said they'll probably put an outside figure on a third gizmo and get back to me and then send it all off for discussion.
So they're going to discuss it. Okay. Uh, what about the book on Ottoman Anchors? The Antrus book I actually got paid for. That was really quite unusual. Um, and that happened because of your friends, Zabina and Frank. Um, Zabina at that time was running the Dusseldorf Film Archive, Dusseldorf Film Museum. And uh, they used to come to the Cinema Museum's uh, annual party, New Year's party, every year. And usually they'd stop here for a day and have a visit for an evening or an afternoon, whatever, and then go off around the rest of London and go to the party and then go back to the Netherlands. And um, they were here one Christmas, must have been 1998. And um, Zabina had just had a hole in her exhibition schedule. Exhibitions, when you're doing exhibitions that aren't film exhibitions, do get planned that year or two years in advance. It goes quite a bit in advance. And this hole had come up very close to being ready to go. And she knew, she and Frank knew that I was working on Anschutz because I've been working on Anschutz quite a bit. Um, found some interesting material that, and I shared that with them. And they asked would I curate an exhibition in Dusseldorf on Anschutz because they had this hole in their exhibition schedule they had to fill. And I thought about it a little bit because, you know, I wasn't ready, I wasn't finished, nothing was really prepared on the one hand. On the other hand, an opportunity for an exhibition that is in your hand, you know, is not a bad thing. You don't have to go out and find somebody that'll take your exhibition. You don't have to go out and find somebody who's interested in the subject. You can just fill in. And half and half, um, it was a favor to them that I said yes. And half and half, I knew it was an opportunity that I just shouldn't say no to, even though I wasn't finished with my research on Anschutz. So I said yes. And they set me up with a woman at the Dusseldorf Film Museum uh, who did a lot of the German work uh, for me. Uh, although my German was better then than it is now, because I don't live there and work there, but then I was doing quite a bit of work. You know, I was writing for Kintop also, mm -hmm. and which they were both involved in. So that's where the exhibition came from. And as the exhibition was solidified, they asked me to write a book and paid me a couple thousand marks, marks in those days, uh, to do it, you know, to accompany the exhibition. And that's where that book came from because it was published then by Kintop. Um, and that was a good book. It's the only modern writing on Anschutz. I'm ready. I really was kind of fed up with Anschutz after I did that show. I didn't do too much work for a while. But I've gone back to him now and I've written a major journal article to prove, I think, to my satisfaction, that... Um, some of the Anschutz chronophotographs and some of the chronophotographs that are not well known at all were on Edison's and Dixon's mind when they set up the kinetoscope and started doing kinetoscope projects. I think that the Edison kinetoscope film, The Barbershop, and also the non-film but semi-film Fred Ott Sneeze are both based on Anschutz topics. And I think I can prove that well. I'm not suicidal as a, as a historian, so before I submitted that article to any journal, I sent it off to Charlie Musser at Yale, because he's the Edison man. And I said, Charlie, what do you think of this? Does this make any sense to you? And he wrote back promptly to say, yes, it makes a lot of sense to me. Go ahead and publish that. You know, it's a, it's, it's a good article. So I knew that he wouldn't object. And at that point, I think I was right about suggesting the Anschutz chronophotographs were on the minds of the team in New Jersey that was making the kinetoscope and starting up the first kinetoscope productions. I've published that article. Um, doesn't seem to have made any difference to anybody's thinking anywhere along the way, but I think it's the first time that anybody really uh, finds any precedence for the kinetoscope filming and the kinetoscope work. Would, would, you, would you compare Anschutz to Mybridge at all? Uh, I mean, would it be 
Maybe well, there were a lot of com comparisons made at the time, and, and a lot of them were made by Anschutz. Anschutz was very, very uh, uh, interested in showing that his work was better than that of Mybridge and that of Marais, uh, who were the other two active guys in the field when he started into the field. Almost all the literature about Anschutz says he was just another counter-photographer late to the field. Mybridge was the pioneer, and Marais did a lot more to invent the cinema. Both of them are not true. The literature is really wrong in this case, and the whole story of chronophotography needs to be readjusted and, and, and rebuilt. Um, Mybridge is clearly the key figure and the important early breakthrough figure. But he didn't really make very good photographs as photographs. The photographs weren't well modeled. You couldn't tell which side of the horse the various legs were on when he did galloping horses. And it, 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 a very difficult character. Um, nothing really quite made sense. And Marta Brown and others have now figured out from his work in Philadelphia that he really was a strange person with a lot of other things on his mind, other than the quote scientific basis that he thought he was present that he presented his work as. It's not scientific at all. It's it's much more dreamlike and uh, much stranger. Um, nobody. It's still true that. Um, Mybridge is the pioneer and the first person to work on in that area, and he showed the way to a lot of other people, um, including Anschutz. But Anschutz, unlike Mybridge and unlike Marais, or anybody else back in those days, you can talk about Ernst Mach or Albert Lund or any of the other characters, Anschutz really wanted to establish photographic moving pictures as a medium of entertainment for the public. There's no question about that. He had something like 153 of his viewing apparatuses made, the Schnellsayer. Um, Heimbridge had one. Um, Lond didn't have any, you know, I mean, nobody else has it. And who makes 153 copies, different models maybe, but who makes 153 viewers for moving pictures unless you want to do it? He had shows in, in Berlin and 20 other German cities. He had shows in France. He had shows in Schnell's Air Parlor here in London on the Strand. You know, everybody knows about that, but everybody just says that's an exception, we lose it. He's the guy who had, um, um, moving pictures, photographic moving pictures, at the Chicago uh, World's Fair in 1893. Mm -hmm. And that was for a long time a confusing piece of literature because a lot of people said they saw stuff at, at Chicago and they thought it was Edison. And there was a long debate in the literature for 30 years over, over, over whether the Edison kinetoscope early on actually appeared in Chicago or didn't appear in Chicago. It didn't appear in Chicago. He gave up his concession. He never sent any machines. So everybody who saw something saw something by Anschutz. This was interestingly relabeled by Anschutz's agent here in London, the Electrical Wonder Company, as the Electrical Wonder. Electricity, Edison, wonders, inventions, Everybody thought it was, it was Edison. There's no reason they, not to think it was Edison. It wasn't. It was Anschutz. And one of the things I'm working on now in the background is I'm trying to collect all the accounts that I can find from the 1930s and so on that talk about, well, I saw this in Chicago and it was the Edison kinetoscope and it was in, because all those accounts are false as to the origin of the material, because it's Anschutz. But I want to see those accounts and see what it was that they saw to find out more about what discs were actually shown in Chicago, because nobody knows. Mm -hmm. um, the stuff was all installed there, but nobody knows. So I'm hoping that this false information, if I can collect it, enough of it, will tell me something more about what Anschutz was showing in, in Chicago. He's really the most important chrono chronophotographer on the way to moving pictures. Marais was never never interested, never interested in 
putting pictures back together. He was dissecting them, dissecting them accurately to talk about their physiological movements and the flight of birds and all the rest of that. He was interested. He only put stuff back together very occasionally, like maybe 11 times out of 1,500 chronophotographs in a little zoetrope, which he bought from Anschutz, actually, in a little zoetrope, just to see if he had got, registered the stuff properly. He wasn't interested in putting it back together. He was interested in taking it apart. Yeah. So he has nothing to do with early motion pictures, he does. And, and your, your book on the chronology of the birth of the cinema, which you issued, what, 25 years ago, and then I've reissued more recently in illustrated format and extended the dates. Well, I extended the dates from the film history. The film history chronology is about one third of the information or even a quarter of the information that's in the new one. Uh, the new book that just came out, out last October is really dense, really dense. And it, it tells a really interesting story. In the first place, I've got almost all of the Mybridge lectures put into that, thanks to Stephen Herbert. I acknowledged him as a source. I didn't just steal it from him. I asked him if I could use it. He said yes. But it's got all the Anschutz exhibitions in it too, which nobody else has got. There's not very much about Marais because he never really patented stuff and he never really did any exhibitions. He never really did any shows, didn't put anything together. He never projected. He talked to us. He said once he was going to project, but then he never did. And um, so there's very little about Marais in it. There is interesting stuff about uh, Jan Evangelista Purkinje and other chronophotographers, other people doing phenicistoscopes and stuff like that as predecessors of moving pictures. And then there's, at the end, the first full year of moving picture cinematography in 1896, up to the 31st of December, 1896. It's about 60% of the whole book is just in that one year. And I've tried to put into that chronology every single exhibition, every single patent, every single event that's a datable event, and every, de every demonstration, so that it's a full look at the first year. And I can tell you, because I was working on this a couple of days ago, one of the interesting things that turns out, we always talk about, well, the Lumiere's exhibit in 1895, in December 1895 at the cafe, and then 1896, the first full year of cinema, and it goes everywhere and it's seen everywhere. What's interesting about that is that if you extract from the data we know about, I know this is incomplete, I know it's not full, but it's everything I could find over a couple of years, so it's pretty close. It's the best document we have to look at things in a broader way. If you look at public shows of moving pictures, public shows, forget the demonstrations, forget the claims, forget the uh, auditions, you know, one thing or another, but public shows. In January 1896, there are four. In February 1896, there are four more. That's worldwide. In March of 1896, there are 22. Now think about it for a minute. That's 22 and 8, which is 30. So think about the first quarter of 1896, January to the end of March. There are exactly 30 public shows of moving pictures. In the world? Hmm? In Britain or in the world? In the world. In the world, so far as we know. In the world. You can see the dates. Pick up your copy of the chronology. Look at the dates. You think about those 30 shows and you think 30 shows for all the cities in Europe, in England, in North Africa, in everywhere else, in North America, in America, Canada, maybe in South America. That's not very much. By the end of the first quarter of 1896, almost nobody has seen a moving picture. Yeah. It's really not an industry. It's not anything else. It's really slow. It starts from nothing. And it grows very slowly. So we really don't, we really get, without the detail, we get the wrong impression of what 1896 means to moving pictures. 
Now, I can't quote you off the top of my head the rest of the figures for the rest of the year, but I've got them on a chart now, so I'm working on that chart a little bit just for kicks. And it's certainly true that moving pictures don't really start to take off as a public entertainment, as take off as a proper, you know, ongoing until at least June or July of 1896. So the first half of then you can kind of freak out. It's still like experimental. Not true, but a little bit. It's the second half of 1896, and it really takes off in 1897. Now, for another article I'm working on, I just counted, and by 1898, um, which is two years into the moving picture era, so you can say, but 1898, in 1898, there are 19 manufacturers in the United Kingdom alone supplying projectors and apparatus to a new industry called moving pictures or cinematography or kinematography as it was called in, in the UK. 19 different manufacturers. Everybody wants a piece of this action. It's growing so fast. It's growing like crazy. But you don't think that when you think about early cinema or what's going on unless you actually look at what's happening. That it starts so slow and it doesn't really start in 1896. It starts in the second half of 1896 and really only picks up in 97 and 98. Just mentioning another early film collector, uh, Will Douglas, who, who um, his collection went to Exeter University. I believe you, you helped with his funeral as well. Is that, is that correct? Yes, I did a memorial service here for Bill. He died pretty much pretty quickly after I got here. I didn't get a chance to know him or meet with him particularly, but it did with his partner, uh, Peter Jewell, um, who worked on the on the memorial service and became a friend, good friend. And is very interested. Peter has been adding to that Bill Douglas collection collection for a long time. He goes around buying things and finding things in antique markets and one thing and another. And um, a very nice guy, Peter. Um, I didn't know uh, uh, Bill Douglas particularly, but I got into some trouble with him. I must have been here three, four months, maybe five months when the, his memorial service came up. And I sat down with Peter and we started doing this. And I started um, a childhood friend of his from his village in Scotland was going to come down to the memorial service and speak. I'm sitting in my office at the NFT one day. I pick up the telephone, and it's this friend of Bill Douglas's from some really small village in the middle of nowhere in Scotland. And he's telling me when he's going to come to, the, when he's going to arrive, and what he's going to do at the at the memorial service. I can't understand a word this guy is saying to me. I ask him to repeat. I still can't. Understand. It's getting really tense because, you know, at some point I'm the host and he's the guest and I've got to be really nice to him and I really want to treat him properly and he was an old friend of Bill Duck. And I have no idea what he's saying to me. I finally called in one of the people in my office who had lived in this country for all her life and said, will you talk to him, please? Because she could maybe parse the accent a little bit better. The accent was so thick. I just had no idea what he was saying to. It was very embarrassing. But he came and it w all worked out in the end, you know. Um, in 1999, you gave a lecture at Momi on the Cana Canadian Film Board. Do you recall that at all? Oh, yes, of course. Canadian Film Board is a wonderful organization. Um, and I, I really used to be very close to their uh, productions. My film teacher, David Shepard, had a deal on with a guy in Montreal named Guy Cote. And David would supply, he wanted to start a, a film archive in Montreal. And, uh, and I think he did, he even had a Cinematheque Canadienne or something like that. Didn't last very long, but it was there for a while. And David was sending him prints, duplicate prints from his own collection classic silent films in Germany, England, Russia. And um, Guy Cote, who had no money, but had access to 
um, new prints from the National Football Board of Canada that he could acquire would send stuff down by diplomatic bag at trading with David. So David always had the latest and most interesting National Film Board films uh, on hand uh, as a trade for his classic silent films he was sending up to Montreal. So he used in his teaching and then showed sometimes to us, the rest of us privately, um, some really interesting National Film Board films like uh, Corral and um, uh, the Norman McLaren films and, and, and others. So from my very earliest days, I had always treasured the National Film Board. And I did from time to time a season of, of new work from them for one reason or another. Um, and I had good relationship with them. Uh, which is where this lecture at the National Film, the National Film Theater came from, because I still think that they're doing interesting work up there. Not all of it, not every time, but they have some brilliant filmmakers whose work should be known more widely than, than, the, than the National Film Board can find or can project, because it always goes under this government umbrella as propaganda and stuff like that. And people tend not to just look at the films, how good they are sometimes, they look at others. I showed, I showed a class, uh, a film class, when I was teaching at the museum school, um, one, one of the Charles Eames films at one point, and I'm interested also in Charles Eames, this one, he made about the furniture designer, yeah. Um, you definitely sat in his chairs, in fact, you're sitting in one of them right now, uh, it's his design, and um, Eames made about 60 films, and they're just brilliant. They're really exquisite films. The longest one, I think, is 12 minutes, and most of them average around three to five minutes long. So I showed them this one film at one point that he had a commission from the um, United States Congress to do a report, an analysis of what a national aquarium might look like. The California senator back in those days was interested in fish and a national aquarium and he wanted to make a national aquarium. So Eames, in his usual interesting way, said, you know, Congress sponsors 300 reports on various topics. Or anything. They're all pieces of paper this thick, you know, thing. And they stack them up and there's, you go into any senator's office and there's stacks of them sitting around, unread, untouched, unknown. So Eames put in his report. They paid him a couple hundred thousand dollars, whatever it was. It was a fee. And he put in a 20-page color brochure and a three and a half minute film. That was his report on the National Aquarium. And he thought that this would get more attention. And it did. It was, he was right about that. But the aquarium never got built because the California senator didn't get reelected or because the money went someplace else. Who, who knows? All speculation. The three and a half minute film is about a small jellyfish that's about the size of the fingernail on your little finger. It goes like this up and down a little bit in the water. And it's called, the film is called Polyorchus haplus, a small hydromedusian. And it, the soundtrack to the film, three and a half minutes, is one element of the uh, Glenn Gould playing the Bach variations. So nice, gentle piano music in the back. And then this thing floats up and, and down a little bit and down. It's a brilliant film. It's really an interesting little tiny piece of, of cinema. And I showed it once to a class saying it was for the National Aquarium and it was this and that. And um, what did they think it was all about? And I got in a discussion after showing this film from a class that I knew I had been teaching them for weeks was the most bizarre material about government propaganda and stuff that only looks at the government's idea of this one. I couldn't believe the discussion that came out afterwards because of the attitude of the class towards the government, not towards the film or filmmaking at all. 
And this kind of happens a lot of times to, to, to things when you take them out of context or you put them in another context. Nobody sees the context anymore. They think that some hidden context is what really makes the film work. No, it's your eyesight makes the film work. The music, Glenn Gould, and a kind of an interesting idea. Not maybe your idea, but an interesting idea none, nonetheless. So it's really difficult sometimes to look at films the way they should be look, should be should be looked at and, and to read what's really there. I forgot to ask you, don't know why, but I did, about your twenty years at Goldsmiths. I mean that was quite a chunk. On well, I did. I did a lot of that. It was a part-time uh, job as a lecturer, and I got into that in other, in other strange ways, actually. Um, but they hired me in the end, and I stayed there for twenty-two years, so that was okay. I taught one module for Goldsmiths, which was really wonderful because they had me teaching um, European cinema after nineteen forty-five. This is an era that I knew well. And it's got all the good film movements. It's got Italian neorealism and the French New Wave and New German cinema and Italian comedies and, you know, you name it, all the... For somebody my age or somebody in my generation, mm -hmm. those are all the good films. And in the end, I knew a lot of the filmmakers or met a lot of the filmmakers or interviewed a lot of the filmmakers and I knew a lot of the films and et cetera. And I knew the field of play so well, actually, because I knew all those films, that I could tell the students to write on anything they wanted to. I mean, it was relevant to the course in one way or another. They could think up that relevancy and if it worked with my approval, they could do anything they wanted to. And, Every once in a while, I found an interesting new film. Do you know of a Norwegian film called Kitchen Stories? No, you've never seen it, never heard of it, Kitchen Stories. I think so. Norway, about 1993, something like that, maybe. That's a bit late for me. Brilliant film, really interesting. I had a Norwegian student, wanted to write about this film, asked me if she could use that film in the thing. I'm not afraid of, you know, a student looking at a film and thinking they're going to end up knowing more about the film than I do. I mean, which a lot of academics, unfortunately, are scared about stuff like this. No, you're, you're right about the films I know, and that's it. You know, it doesn't really produce necessarily a best relation, your best reaction in, in, in a student. Mm -hmm. So I told her yes, and instantly went out and bought a copy of the DVD. I'd never seen the film, but I don't mind I won't do this for 40 people, but I don't mind for one or another. Somebody reaches out to a film I didn't know. The film is brilliant. It's really exciting. It's a very, very interesting film. I just loaned it to a friend of mine who's a West End actor uh, who's um, in Charlton. Um, and uh, he just looked at it last week and was just overwhelmed by the film. It's really brilliant. It, it, and that's how you find interesting stuff, you know, mm -hmm. because you have students that you encourage rather than that you try and put into a into a bell curve somewhere and kind of push off in a direction that only you know about. You know, it doesn't it doesn't really help. I had a lot of fun teaching at at, at, at Goldsmiths. I had a lot of fun teaching also at the Museum of Fine Arts. I liked those students too. I was there 13, 14 years. And um, I liked both of that. I I wasn't the favorite person in the film in the in the English department at Goldsmiths where I was teaching because other faculty who had options that they were offering found them very slow to fill, only maybe just barely made the break even point to actually have the course run. And my option, which was capped, filled up in the first two days totally full two days that was it a lot of jealousy in that department and a lot of people didn't like what i was doing because they couldn't stand somebody who was more popular than they were i didn't necessarily hear about that directly or see it a lot directly but it, it was it was kind of awful really but i love the students
couple of questions to wind up, but about locally about your local cinema, Deptford and your wind band, could you, which is obviously peripheral to your, to your cinema. The Deptford Cinema, which I think is here, isn't it? Yeah. The Deptford Cinema Cup. And I still use that when I, I still use that every day when I brush my teeth. Um, was named the best local cinema in the UK two years in a row. And it was. Um, they had a really wide ranging program and uh, organization. I didn't start it, but I went down there to volunteer. It was all run by volunteers reasonably early, maybe after they'd been open for a year or so. And to a certain extent, I found chaos because they were open to everybody who were going to show every, any kind of film anybody wanted to. And they had forgotten things like deadlines and forward planning. And it was just kind of a, kind of a mess. And I got a group of the volunteers together and we sorted out some principles of operation, which meant that you had to have your program together and available by a certain date, and then you could program it in public by a certain date and go on. And they did that for the next 10 years. Um, so I kind of had some influence there, thank goodness. And I did a few programs where uh, stuff I wanted to show, and it worked out pretty well, actually. I was surprised how well it worked out. But the cinema closed up was named the best local cinema in the U.S. by whatever BFI or does that survey or gives that award two years in a row, and it lasted maybe another five years. But then they f they fell to one of two things, and I don't know which because I wasn't uh, involved so much at the time. It, they either fell to business rates, which the council imposed on them, regardless of whether or not they were a cultural asset or an asset to the community or whatever, the arguments about that all the time, or it fell to the landlord wanting serious rent back or rent more or something or other. So they closed down. They're still kind of operating. There's a network of people who were once involved. I get an email every once in a while. There will be a screening this Sunday um, somewhere. Every once in a while I do a screening under the Deptford Cinema uh, okay. umbrella. So they're still hoping to find the right place. It was a little tiny cinema, had maybe 60 seats, maybe 65, not many. Mm. But they put so much, the kids put so much work into that. They built it up so beautifully and had such good volunteers to keep it going. I, I was really sad to see that Go the away. pandemic may have had an effect, actually. I think they closed before that, actually. I think they closed before that. Um, and I really wish that they had been they had been doing that. Some of them came to the bias group, actually. One or two of them did. And I think we did show a film um, which one of them wanted to show a few years ago. The yeah, no, there are, you've got to put me on the mailing list for the Kennington Bioscope. I want to get hear more about that. I want to... Well, Bob will tell you how to do that. I can say a little bit about the the, the Acres book. This is working at the moment. Which is that's, the, that's, the, that's the current book, and that's the book I'm waiting for an answer from a press to see if they'll publish it or not. I think they will, but it's academic time, so it'll just take a little while for that to happen. I hope they do. They, they, they really should. But that's a book that's being written by Barry Anthony, a uh, very experienced uh, researcher, uh, two books with uh, Richard Brown and lots of other stuff, and also by uh, with uh, Peter Domenkowitz, who's a young scholar who's a really fanatic researcher. He's really fine stuff that nobody has ever seen before. He's really quite good. And myself, and the three of us are writing a book on Bert Acres. Uh, I can say in general, broadly, that everybody I talk to in the UK, including you, including Luke McKernan, including Stephen Herbert, including Brian Coe, including, you know, name anybody who's interested in early cinema. They all think that Bert Akers deserves a book and that he's been kind of lost and forgotten and abandoned. Um, everybody thinks that something on Akers is overdue. Um, we're at the point right now where we've got a book about 70% written, uh, long chapters 
really complete a filmography that has at least three times as many films that Akers was involved in than John Barnes ever found, wasn't interested in Akers, you know, et cetera. So we're going to have a book, um, and I hope we have a publisher in the next couple of months. I, I was uh, talking to the publisher last week, and they're going to do one more round of um, looking for uh, outside readers and uh, adjudicators and then they'll see if they can put it into their publication program which I hope they do um, I'm also waiting you wonder the academics you know NFT dossiers right you get the option to do one because you have this n wonderful new season of fifth generation Chinese films. You have a guy in Germany that you just happen to know, Klaus Ader, who's a major film critic in, in, in Germany and has been for 30 years, who's going to headline the thing. And we get a good text together and, 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 and you can do a dossier on this, the first one ever on this new Chinese generation of filmmakers you know, back in 1992, 93, a long time ago now. But you can do this and you can have the whole thing built, printed, set out, distributed, gone in six or eight weeks. You know, I mean, it doesn't take any longer than that. You, it's the same mind, the same intelligence and the same careful copy editing and the same volunteer work. And you call in a couple of friends, and et cetera. But I'm waiting now almost two years for one of the hardest articles I've ever written to be published. And it's an article on an important subject because it's on cinematic raw stock. It's on the beginnings of when people started making films and who was supplying them and how they were made and where they were being shown and what was going on. This is the the film itself, huh? the whole thing. And the problem is, <clears throat> I think for a lot of historians, the problem is that there's no literature on this. Nobody's written about this. Very, very little. Um, which means there's nobody to copy from and be smarter and add in three phrases and find a new way of structuring it to prove that you're smarter than anybody else who's ever written about that which is what most academics are really up to. Now, I don't mean to be quite so cynical about the academic life. I believe in the academic life. I've lived the academic life. I still do. But let me tell you, they also get extra awards for laziness and sloppy research and bad ideas and etc. So somebody called me up again, you sent me an email. Nobody uses the telephone anymore. The telephone hasn't rung while we, while we've been sitting here. I got an email one day from a woman in New Zealand. She and her team, there are three of them, mid-career academics, ambitious, want to publish, get their next job, are doing a book on raw stock. They're going to cover the whole thing, raw stock, changes in, in uh, emulsions, all the rest of it. Would I write the opening chapter on the early material? Because they know I know something about this because I published in the FIAF book, This Film is Dangerous, an article on celluloid and the early days of film stock. Not very well on the early days of film stock, but pretty good on mm -hmm. celluloid and the other stuff. So I said yes. So in the end, a lot of really hard work because there is no literature on this. Nobody knows anything about this stuff. I buy a row of about 15 books on celluloid and early celluloid and plastics and et cetera. It's up there on the top shelf to desperately look for some information. Very little there, unfortunately. I don't mind having the books. Nobody else has got them, but very little. I end up writing a 12,000 word chapter on early raw stock and I clear up a few things because the literature is very confused. Edison um, Eastman's tables that he made raw stock on tables 
were either 50 feet long or 200 feet long, and they did this, or they were stripped, or they weren't. You know, everybody's got a slightly different story about that because nobody looked at the whole picture. I know how it started, what it got to, when they moved to the new building and made them 200 feet long, etc. I've got that all straightened out finally, and a lot of other suppliers, and etc. So I hand in this article on the deadline, I think generous deadline, six months or something. It took me six months to put that together. About a year later, I get a, uh, another email from these guys saying, um, we've just, we've looked at your article closely and we've got some notes and could you reorganize it in this way? Could you do this? Could you make, and some of the suggestions are very good. And of course they want it shorter because 12,000 words is too, is too long. So I go through and I reorganize it in some of the ways they're suggesting, very perfectly happy to do that. And um, I add in a couple of new things I found somewhere along the way. And it gets to be 14,000 words long, not shorter, it's longer. Meanwhile, they were going to give it to, give it to um, publishers after the first six months, after the deadline really came in. Six months later, they're going to approach a publisher three months from now. I don't hear anything. I don't know what's going on. Now they're waiting. It's now February, January of this year. And I get another email from these guys who have some more suggestions about how to work on the article and how to rearrange it, some of which are not very good. And they still want it shorter. So I go through a couple of suggestions that are OK. I say why I'm not doing the other suggestions. And it turns out to be longer again. The article is now 15,500 words long, because I found another interesting story to tell somewhere in there. So it gets longer. As of January, they're going to submit the book for reading by outside readers to a publisher in June. That's this month, and I hope they've submitted it because this is almost another month, two years since I started that article and wrote it, and it's still out there in limbo. Mm. Somewhere a year ago, I said, do you still want it? You know, I mean, I'll, I'll, I can publish this anywhere and I'll publish it someplace else if you don't want it. Oh no, we still want it. We are keeping an eye out and nobody else is writing on this topic. Oh, that's interesting. I don't know how you know that. I couldn't possibly know that. that. Nobody else in the early cinema community anywhere is writing about early raw stock and not going to publish the, you know, but I finished my thing a year and a half ago now. You'll be coming up on two years by the time you get back to me again. And you're just sitting on it. I don't really want to be trumped by somebody who had the idea or heard from one of your colleagues or somewhere else that was something going on and kind of decides mm -hmm. to write it all by themselves mm -hmm. in some other different direction. Hmm. But I'm waiting for that to be published. I'm waiting to hear that they published that if they submitted that in June this month, if that is just submitted to a publisher, that's going to go out to a reader or a couple of readers. They're going to get four months to do that. So we don't hear anything until September, October, whether they're going to take it or not. And they're either going to start the whole process over again or whatever. I don't know. Hmm. I'm waiting for that to be published. It's a good article, actually. It's very comprehensive. Very kind. It's a really good article. Because um, I went into a couple of things that nobody expected me to go into. I had a couple of good ideas. And it, it's going to be fine. Then I've got Street Cinematographs, which I'm working on now. Slowly. And you got your wind band. And, and you used to film with the wind band, which is really cool. Well, the, the, wind, the wind band was, I was going to say it's a mistake, but it's not a mistake. Um, it's really fantastic. This is a um, Suffolk wind band that has existed since the 1950s and still going. It's well set up. It's well organized. It started out as an evening course, Suffolk council and at some point the council gave up funding evening courses for adults like music courses but everybody who was playing in their group wanted to keep playing so they just went independent and kept playing and it's been around for a long time which is very good and uh, i 
always wanted to play the saxophone. I just for no better reason I liked to play the saxophone. And when I was a kid, I was a trombone player because I could reach the end of the thing. And so somebody in my school said, oh, you play this because you can reach that and you do that. So I played that. And I played pretty good actually in the end, but it wasn't really my instrument. It wasn't something I was going to keep up. So I, when I got to university, I gave it up. And when I got to Boston, I got to know a lot of the people around Berkeley College because they were nice people and a couple of good in invitations there. And I sold the horn, my horns on because they weren't being played, they needed to be played. So here at one point, when my daughter started playing musical instruments, I decided to try the saxophone, tenor saxophone, and I bought the cheapest Chinese tenor saxophone I could buy because I thought how silly I was. I thought that maybe my daughter was a French horn player and she and I could play some duets, you know, at some point, and she got a little bit older and could play a little bit more music. And I would by then learn something about the saxophone. I don't think I could name to you any piece of music written for French horn and tenor saxophone. I don't think it exists. Now there might be something somewhere obscure, but she's never let on that she knows about it and I can't find it. So that idea didn't work. And she went with me one night to a church in Dulwich where we were members and attendees because they were selling, their, they were celebrating their 50th anniversary. And I don't remember the 50th anniversary of the building or the congregation or what. It was 50th anniversary all week, they elaborate stuff. Why do you come out five nights a week just for a 50th anniversary of some local church? Don't ask me. But they had this night, the um, South London Jazz Orchestra playing as a part of their celebrations, it was Monday night. Uh, Slow Joe, it's called, and they've been around doing big band jazz for a long time and quite successfully, not only ever around the South London, but also um, they've been at music festivals in Europe and Scotland and everywhere else. They go up to the Edinburgh Festival every year and do a couple of gigs. And at the break in the band, I wanted, I went down, I wanted to hear the band. And at the break, um, I went off to get a glass of wine, cheap wine indeed, and talk to a couple of people I knew. My daughter, who was nine years old, went up to the band leader and said, you need a French horn in this band. And the band leader, who was a smart cookie, looked down at her and said, oh, do you play the French horn? And she said, yes, I do. And the band leader said, well, in fact, I don't have music for a French horn for this band, but I've got another band. So from Monday to Thursday, on Thursday night, we were at the wind band rehearsals. I was taking her down there so she could play with a wind band, who had an occasional French horn, but basically nothing else. So I'm sitting in the back of the room, happily reading a book, which I'll happily do at any point, and a band leader can't stand, he's an American, and can't stand empty hands, idle hands. Right? Reading is an idle hand to him. So he gets me involved in doing some work in a library and this and that. What I'm doing by taking her down to the rehearsal down in Dulwich and wading through the rehearsal and coming back is I'm absolving him of all childcare responsibilities and other kinds of things. I'm the parent and I'm there throughout and nobody is pestering my, my child, you know, this is all set up. So it's all fine. So meanwhile, I'm trying to learn how to play the saxophone on this cheap tenor I bought, see whether it'll stick, you know, you just don't know. And I'm half a year taking her down to rehearsals. And up comes the gig in the spring, earlier spring, for the London Marathon, because this band plays at the London Marathon every year. I did this a few weeks ago. And 
this particular year, they had nobody who wanted to play for the London Marathon. Nobody signed up. They had like maybe nine people, maybe 11 in the band. They really need 16, 17 to make it work. And then they need more than that, actually, to be a good band. They didn't have anybody. So I went to my daughter, because it was her band. And I didn't want to take over stuff from her or anything else, and asked if I could maybe play the saxophone. They play simple stuff for the marathon. I said, I can probably play that stuff. You know, it's a pretty simple book. Can I go and volunteer to play and for the marathon? Because I think I can probably handle that. And she said, yes, go ahead and do it. I didn't want to step on her toes. So I go and I play the marathon. And I find out, no, when you're at tempo and you're up with those book and their symph symph and their syncopation, I really can't play that well yet. I really don't know what I'm doing. So I, I put it back here, to put a saxophone back away, and went back to taking her down to the rehearsals. And a couple of the older members of the band, more or less my age, start saying, why aren't you playing? Why didn't you bring your saxophone? You know what? And I kind of got forced into playing with the band because of that. And that's got to be 13 years ago. So that's got to be all right, 20, 20, around 2010, maybe 29, something like it, 2010. So I started playing down there. The saxophone stuck. I went out and bought a better saxophone, which was a proper one. Got rid of the uh, cheap Chinese instrument, which wasn't bad, but which really wasn't helpful either. And I've been playing there ever since. I was on their committee for a few years. My daughter played with them until five or six years ago when she went to the Purcell School as a horn player and went from there to Guildhall School of Music and Drama as a horn student and has now graduated with a degree as you know, a good professional horn player. She's really excellent at that, better than I ever would be. And um, kind of comes back once in a while to a gig that she likes with the wind band, but I'll play, I play them all. We'll be at Borough Market on the 24th. We'll be in Brighton and the Brighton Pavilion um, in August. We'll be in a couple of bandstands here or there. We play a lot in the bandstands in the summer when we can. And that's it. I rehearse every Thursday, which is why I don't do anything else on Thursdays. All right, well, that's a nice story to finish with. I think. Thank you, Dee, for sharing your life memories with us. Yeah. I can do it again. New stories. <laughs> well, you might have to check it.